All right, great, excellent. So I'm gonna call the board meeting to order. A couple of um, options here. So the facility and safety awareness committee is here. So thank you for attending this evening's board meeting. EWIP management and subject matter experts are here with us in the room and virtually. During tonight's presentations, remote speakers will appear on the screen. Please make sure to speak loudly and clearly so everyone can hear you. Guests are invited to sign up at the table at the back of the room if they wish to provide public testimony. Visitor access is limited to the board meeting room and the restrooms. Restrooms are located on the first floor through the exit on the right hand door uh, across the hallway. In case of an emergency, such as a fire alarm, exit through the glass door at the back of the room unless it is not safe to do so. The alternate emergency exit is located at the rear of the building just beyond the restroom, so through this door. During an evacuation, follow staff's instructions and stay together for safety. Tonight's meeting will be recorded. The recording will start when the meeting is called to order and will continue until adjournment. Meeting room will be muted during the break. Aside from that period, virtual participants on the screen and public audience will be able to hear conversations in the room until the meeting is disconnected. All right. Uh, first up, we have an agenda check. Seeing no changes, we will jump into items from board members and general manager. I'm to start. Nothing from me. Okay. Uh, two, two items. I just wanted for the record to ask if you could get back to me and tell me if, if and when we have any plans to extend water lines out Cleveland Lane to the UGV expansion area for industrial lands. I had that question today. And then I'd like to thank and commend uh, EWEB staff for donating uh, ill used office equipment and furniture that we could use to some of the nonprofits, especially Bags of Love, the people that make uh, things for children going into the foster care system. I think that was really good that you did that, and I really appreciate that. Before we take stuff out of the landfill, and make it. So thank you very much. I would just like to uh, congratulate staff on closing on the headquarters building. Congratulations, I know there's a ton of work for everybody involved, but really appreciate all the effort. And the board members as well that put in extra work um, in sorting out options. I was going to say thank you for the open house before closed. I thought that was really lovely. And it's an opportunity to say goodbye to that chapter. Anything? Okay. All right, Frank. Thanks. Yep. Um, President Carlson, commissioners, good evening. I um, just a couple of things. Um, I I wanted to thank the commissioners for their involvement uh, with the headquarters uh, sale to the city. I particularly wanted to thank EWEB staff and also Sarah Maderi and city staff. Um, the the process with the city was was really productive, um, and I think it it strengthened. The relationship between eWeb and the city, and so uh, that comes back to the people involved. And so I wanted to thank staff and and uh, city staff uh, for that. Uh, the other thing uh, to cover this evening is the uh, couple of different um, correspondence items. Um, just just for review, um, there were there were four uh, items in particular. Uh, one is an annual update on our enterprise risk and the various areas that we're continuing to look at as far as mitigation. Uh, risk is all around us um, and part of uh, continuing our products and services is, a, is an ongoing assessment of that risk. Uh, the other one was an update on some uh, federal legislation that was driven into the state of Oregon relative to the lead and copper rule revisions. Uh, this really extends uh, to both the eWeb side and the customer side of the meter and the fact that we have to have an inventory of that, of which we're in process. Um, pretty lengthy state legislative update um, after the largest or sorry, the longest walkout um, in, in history. Uh, there was a flurry of activity um, and Jason is actually on vacation. If there's further questions uh, relative to some of the, the passage of bills in the last same number of hours, but the last few days um, in Salem, um, we're uh, continuing to digest what that means for our organization, uh, in particular with some of the uh, combined um, climate resiliency packages that uh, that were passed. And then finally, um, um, of, as a follow up to last month's uh, meeting, uh, there was a couple of revisions to the strategic plan that the commissioners voted on. 
I just wanted to reiterate that back uh, to commissioners based on the interpretation of the two changes that were involved in that. So that was the, the correspondence and be happy to address anything further, but that was that was my update. Anybody have anything on correspondence? John. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank staff for the risk, uh, the risk memo that we got. I think it was it was well put together. And for people in the audience, this it's all available online. It showed what our risks are, what we're doing to mitigate it um, in a whole different a whole bunch of areas, and and that was very helpful. And then the other thing that I was really, it, it was very timely, was the lead and copper rule uh, memo that we got, uh, you know, last last week in the news, it was like 50% of the water in, in the United States is tainted. And we're lucky to have a robust program here to make sure that our water is, is not tainted. And if there is some form of lead piping between the, meter and and the house we're doing the best that we can to try and identify those and remedy those uh, wherever they happen uh, you know a lot of housing stock was built a long time ago so we're not exactly sure what's in there but we're doing our very best to make sure that the, the water we have is safe and the best water we have around and so that, i think that that memo was very timely considering the, what was in the news last week so i just wanted to reiterate that to staff thank you Okay, we're done with correspondence then. We will move to the public input. So, uh, when your name is, so I'll open the, the public testimony period. When your name is called, please come forward and clearly state your name and optionally your address or ward. Each speaker will be offered three minutes to present their testimony. Please keep track of time by watching the timer at the front of the room or by listening for an audio notification when three minutes has elapsed. If you are participating by telephone, remember to unmute your call. Press star six if calling from a landline or simply use the unmute button if calling from your cell phone. After all testimony is heard, each prisoner will have an opportunity to speak if they choose, although by policy you do not need to engage in a back and forth dialogue. Please note that failure of a commissioner to speak shall not be construed as support of or opposition to any speaker's testimony. The question is presented by a speaker and the board does not provide an answer. An e staff member will contact the speaker so the question can be addressed at a later time. So here's the. I have four people that are signed up to provide testimony via the phone. I think I'll go through those first and then I'll go through the, the pile from the room. Um, any tech issues, we can work those out while others are. Testifying. So what the, so I have Catherine Chetty and then Kathy Gang, followed by Daniel Noonan and Craig Patterson. And please forgive me if I have mispronounced any names or mispronounce any names following this. Okay, so uh Catherine Chetty, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, great. My name is Catherine Chuddy, and I'm testifying on behalf of Oregon Conservancy Foundation. OCF opposes inclusion of SMNRs in eWeb's IRP for the following key reasons that are further addressed in our written testimony submitted today due to eWeb's three minute time limit on oral testimony. In 1980, Oregon voters adopted a ballot measure law requiring that before a nuclear power plant can be built and operated in our state, there must first be a permanent federal license repository for the storage of its high level nuclear waste, followed by a statewide vote of the people. This law was adopted after PGE and EWEB's Trojan nuclear plant had already been built and operating in Oregon. 43 years later, highly radioactive spent fuel still sits in dry casks at Trojan's nuclear plant site near Rainier, Oregon. There is still no permanent federally licensed high-level waste repository capable of safely storing this nuclear waste. EWEB's promotion of proposed SMNRs ignores the fact that if these unproven advanced reactors do operate, they will add still more high-level nuclear waste in need of permanent repository storage. EWEB informs ratepayers that it can legally obtain power from advanced nuclear reactors operated out of state. EWEB fails to tell its ratepayers that it is also actively seeking to repeal Oregon's 1980 ballot measure law. 
In March 2023, EWEB testified in support of House Bill 2215, which, if enacted, would have cleared the way for SMNRs to be built and operated in Oregon. By supporting this legislation, EWEB is promoting creation of more high-level nuclear waste without a permanent radioactive waste repository, nor a statewide vote of the people. This does not meet EWEB's IRP priority of environmental responsibility. OCF urges EWEB's board and staff to perform a more diligent and thorough analysis of available renewable energy, conservation, and energy efficiency alternatives, as well as the veracity of the nuclear industry's claims regarding SMNRs. Please review OCF's written testimony submitted for the record as it addresses agenda items number eight and number nine. Thank you so much for the opportunity to um, provide input. Thank you, Catherine. Okay, next up, we have Kathy Gain. Kathy, are you on? Okay, I'm not hearing Kathy, so we're going to move on and we can come back later. Daniel Noonan. Okay. Not hearing you if you. And it's star six on mute if you're calling from the landline. Okay, we will come back. Next up, Craig Patterson. We have not joined. Okay. All right, we're going to move to the room. I'll come back to the phone. Uh, so first up, I have Vincent McClellan, followed by uh, Dave Palmer, and then Eva Edelman. So Vincent McClellan, thank you. Hi, thanks for allowing me to speak. And uh, thanks for the board meeting on this particular subject. Um, I would like to speak out against uh, nuclear power being a part of the IRT that's being proposed. Um, <clears throat> the levelized cost of electricity for nuclear power is some of the most expensive that is currently available and will raise rates for the entire EWEB grid. Um, that's been proven over and over again in any place. I mean, the, the um, facility that just went online in Georgia kind of proved that there was cost overruns. It took an extra several years to build the facility. I don't believe that nuclear power is in the best interest of the citizens of Eugene. And I <clears throat> kind of at a loss to why it's even being considered. Um, and I don't want to be too redundant, but I also have an issue with the storage, like was already mentioned, that uh, the Trojan nuclear power plant, which has now been dismantled, still has all of its uh, spent nuclear fuel rods still in place close to the Columbia River in Oregon. With no permanent storage since the federal government uh, reneged on their uh, <clears throat> they are promised to provide permanent nucle nuclear waste storage. We don't have anywhere to put this type of material. Um, and we currently live in a very highly seismic area. We've already learned from the um, Japanese disaster that even a really well thought out nuclear reactor is well engineered to be damaged by seismic activity. I don't believe that a nuclear reactor, even a small one, even the current versions of nuclear reactors should be sited in Oregon at all. And I'd also like to bring up again, um, I'm a solar contractor, many of you know me here. I'd like to bring up that uh, EWEB is still currently telling us as solar contractors that you don't need power coming from solar electric systems in our area. Um, and so they're still limiting the commercial, my commercial client's ability to uh, put up more than 25 kilowatts per meter as a net metered system. And we have the generation program, which is great but that adds a lot of cost and expense to my clients and doesn't make the financial 
uh, scenario of a solar electric system worked out very well. So I'm confused in your, on one, one hand, you're limiting power going into the grid and saying you don't need it. On another hand, you're looking at bringing in a very dangerous form of electricity generation. Okay, thank you, oh, thank you. Sorry, Vincent. Sorry, your time is up. <laughs> Appreciate your listening to me. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Kathleen is on the line now. Uh, please admit her. We'll go back to her at the end then. Okay. Uh, Dane Palmer. Thank you. My name is Dane Palmer. I live on uh, Liebert Dam Road in Liebert, Oregon. I'm here tonight to address this board regarding the decommissioning of Liebert Dam. This board's decision to decommission the dam in the estimation of the McKinsey residents is careless and irresponsible. You have made the decision to remove the dam, which creates a very important recreation area attracting and used by hundreds of people every week. You are devastating the recreational assets and business the area so desperately needs. At this point, your decisions are well known by the upriver residents, obviously, but almost unknown to the rest of the customers in your service area. Some of my concerns, as I'm sure it would be the rest of your customers, are the assets that you will be abandoning. You recently did work on the dam roll gates with an estimated cost of $5.2 million, which your ratepayers have been paying for and will continue to pay for in future years, and you now want to remove the dam. You, within the last couple of years, invested $7.6 million in the Holden Creek substation, which has not been used to capacity since its completion, and you now want to abandon that investment. The $13 million you are abandoning pale in comparison to the cost of tearing out the dam which is estimated to cost $225 million. I just wonder if you've let your ratepayers throughout your entire service area know what impact your decisions are having on everyone. How much will your customer's electricity bill go up as a percentage in order to pay the $225 million plus interest. <clears throat> have you considered the environmental impact your work will have on the beautiful McKinsey Valley? What is the impact of the fish hatchery when the dam is gone? What is the toll on the covered bridge going to be with all of the additional car, truck, and semi-truck traffic? What is the impact of the falling real estate values and property tax revenues your project will have? And the last thing I'll mention is that you are destroying an important piece of green energy, which has become extremely important, no matter how large, how small that percentage might be. Thank you, Daniel. Three minutes. Your decisions regarding the dam removal are flawed, very, very flawed. Thank you. All right, next up we have Eva followed by Victor and uh, Stephen Fuller Wallow. Uh, against. Um, my name is Eva Edelman. I live at 3003 West 11. That's a 97402 here. So um, I, I'd like to say that. that the previous two speakers talking about um, the difficulty getting solar and the, the proposed dismantlement of the Liebert Dam, our water power, like this is incomprehensible to me. 
like instead of having alternatives, we're going like the proposal to study nuclear as a possibility that is like nuclear nuclear waste leaks into the environment. It's been leaking a Trojan, it leaks at Hanford where the proposed Hanford is like a multiplex of nuclear waste. It's like amazingly um, contaminated. It, um, nuclear waste, like it's in the water in the Columbia, right? And like you add a little nuclear modular, small nuclear power plant that supposedly um, will um, prevent a meltdown. Like we've heard this before that it automatically, well, we've heard things, there's all these safeguards, but that doesn't mean they really will exist in every single case. That hasn't happened. Fukushima, you know, it just doesn't happen. And meanwhile, children, our children, our people, like how much thyroid disease is there in America and the world, how much cancer, like skyrocketing rates of cancer. We had a mini nuclear war in Nevada the amount of nukes that were tested that leaked into the environment. And now we have the children's IQ going way down, low thyroid, thyroid, radioactive iodine affects, you know, the children. It gets all over America. I grew up in New York and it, there was radioactive iodine in New York from those little tests. Like if this little mini reactor had a problem, and exploded the waste at Hanford. You know, it's inconceivable. That's like worse than Fukushima to explode all the waste stored at Hanford. So um, we're in a nuclear free zone. We shouldn't even be considering funding a study of something that voters reject. We said we don't want nukes in this in this um, state and this county also, unless there's a, something to do with waste, well, that isn't on the horizon. And meanwhile, it's like totally going against the voters. What are you guys thinking? Thank you, Eva. Uh, next up, we have Victor. Thank you. Uh, Andy Sanders. Yes, I am uh, Victor Oblovac. I'm at the top of the rain highway, Ward 3. And I just want to piggyback on what everyone else is saying. I mean, nuclear is very, very bad. Germany 2024, they shut down everything. All the nuclear power plants. Huh? Germans are not stupid, right? So why don't we want to go there? Uh, the solar here is really good. The wind is really good. When I was pedaling here, I went down Bertelsen and I saw a hookup for the solar photovoltaic and an old windmill looked like the 1920s Jacobson windmill or a modern version of. It was going great. I mean, if you look at the cost of electricity, solar and wind, where the wind farms, it's so easy to do. Why in the world would we want to do nuclear? Hanford is the most toxic place on the planet. That's no exaggeration. You add up all the wastewater and all the stuff there, and all the waste from children. I mean, we just don't want to touch it. This is the fourth time the people of the entire state of Oregon or Eugene are saying no nukes. You want to know? Put it on the bill. Yes, no, never. That's what you need to do. Because we don't want it. We've had enough. We've had enough sickness, cancer, etc. And there's no place you can put it. The half-life of plutonium is 27,000 years. The half-life of uranium is 4.5. So you got between 27,000 and 4.5 billion years, and you got cesium 137 and iodine and all the other things thrown in. Where on earth can you put it that you can guarantee it could be safe for four and a half billion years for 27,000 years? Remember, there was an ice age 12,000 years ago. So 
No, we don't want it. Thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Stephen, followed by Sandy Sanders, Jeff Hall, Jeff Thank you. Good evening. My name is Stephen Fullerell. I live in Ward 7. I'd first like to thank the IRP team for the early briefings on the IRP. I'm active with several groups that identify false solutions to the climate crisis. Two of these false solutions appear in the IRP nuclear power and biomass energy. These are not just false solutions, but they also distract from the increasingly urgent need to identify and act on real climate solutions. They should therefore not be included in the IRP or receive ratepayer funding from EWEB. First off, okay. uh, SMRs. They seem to be no more than an opportunistic rebranding of old big nuclear. Small appears to be the new sales pitch for the same failed technology. Beside poor cost per kilowatt hour, dubious safety, and poor carbon life cycle of SMRs and the fuel, there's also the elephant in the room, nuclear waste. As others have said, there's no realistic solution for what to do with the waste from Trojan. The hot mess lives on in Trojan in a pit. This suggests a conclusion for those considering an investment in nuclear. When you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. Other supply alternatives should be prioritized to fill the need for flexible energy supply. And then biomass. This was categorized as a renewable energy resource by the IPCC and the renewable Oregon Renewable Portfolio. However, it would have made use of otherwise unused bio waste, biomass waste. Now the tail is wagging the dog. Forests in the southeast are being clear cut for pellets will be exported to Europe as a replacement for coal in plants operated by Drax. And Drax is coming to Longview. The time scales of renewability do not match. A forest can be clear cut in days. It takes decades for a forest to regrow to the stage when it's sequestering significant amounts of carbon. Biomass is not a clean fuel. It burns worse, it, uh, carbon emissions are worse than for coal. Biomass emits, emits carbon at every stage from the forest to the burner. Carbon capture from biomass burning, BECCS, is turning out to be less than feasible. Other emissions, other pollutants are also significant for those of us living downwind from the former Seneca Cogen, Cogen plant. The new owner of Sierra Pacific, the new owner Sierra Pacific plans to double the production and this will make things worse. Timber industry biomass needs to stay in the forest to maintain soil fertility. In conclusion, nuclear energy and bio en nuclear energy and bioenergy are both false climate solutions. They divert attention and investment from real climate solutions. Please instruct staff to take them out of the IRP. Thank you. Next up, we have Community Standards, followed by Deborah Higby. Followed by Sid. Uh, Sandy Sanders, and I live on 800 Maxwell Road, and I'm a customer. We pay $250 a month about for uh, all of our utilities. And that we are talking about nuclear now after coming through the 80s and eliminating this, I thought. Here we are again talking about a destructive, ecocidal technology that is just should be buried deep, never touched again. The bombs, the radiation, the plants, it's all a travesty of reality. Five years ago, New Scale tried to come with their little mini nukes and uh, get them through the legislature. Uh, my wife and I made this postcard and we're with a group of people that nixed it in the Senate. And we don't want to see this anymore. The people in Oregon have voted against it four times. We don't want it. It's our right to say no. Let us vote on it if we have to. The sun is free. Why aren't we doing putting all of our money in finding out how, how to turn solar energy into easy, free electricity? Distribute it on every rooftop. Everyone would be generating electricity. We could share with one another. 
And then the, the problem is that centralized uh, control of energy would not make money for corporations. Now, why this is a public entity, why would you guys worry about such a thing? It's really strange to me that we're not going all sold. This is a doable thing. <coughs> Let's do it. Yesterday, yesterday I saw this article. It was published on the 4th by PBS about um, dumping a Fuji, uh, uh, Fukushima's nuclear waste material into the Pacific Ocean. China is not going to buy fish from that area in the ocean. Why are they doing that? Because it's poison. Why are we talking about putting poison in the state next to us? Are we going to put it in the Willamette River? Are we going to put it in the Columbia? This is all insane. I'm an artist and uh, my friend Ralph and I had a show at New Zone Gallery in May. It's called The War on Humanity. And for us, this is part of this corporate 1% rich person war on humanity to extract as much profit and destroy as much in the process as they can possibly get away with. You all are working for the public. This is not for the rich and stupid corporate ideas like New Scale. Please stop. This is insanity. Thank you. We have Deborah Hickby. Hello, my name is Deborah Hickby, and I live at 1281 Dalton. Um, and I'm incorporated to Eugene. And um, you're faced with a decision whether to include nuclear energy in the IRP or biomass. And I'm here to speak about nuclear energy, but I urge you to not waste our money on either one of these. They do not, well, nuclear energy does not pass the test of affordability, reliability, or environmental responsibility. Any ratepayer money used for speculative small reactors represent an op opportunity cost for the things we care about, such as renewables, conservation, storage, and et cetera. In, is nuclear power going to help the United States decarbonize its energy supply and fight climate change? Probably not. That's the conclusion of a remarkable new study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in early July. It's remarkable because it's not written by opponents of nuclear power, as one might expect given the conclusion. The authors are, in fact, extremely supportive of nuclear and view its loss as a matter of profound concern. They explain that as costs for SMRs go up, renewable energy technologies seem to be on it trajectory toward subsidy independence. They are falling in cost at ridiculous rates, not just wind and solar, but storage, EVs and other grid edge technologies as well. Policy can accelerate their progress or impede it, but at this point it cannot stop them. They have a momentum of their own, purely on economics. Nuclear is in a different situation. Its current trajectory is decline. It needs lots and lots of new policy and public money to reverse that trajectory. That is a much more difficult political lift. <coughs> Better or worse, renewable energy is the name of the game for the next few decades, this new report explains. Small modular reactors are not environmentally responsible. The proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences also explained that new reactor waste is higher in volume and radioactivity per unit energy produced than large nuclear power reactors. Small reactors will not make less waste. The most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that came out in March 2023 shows that the most effective ways to limit climate change are to use solar and wind power to enhance energy efficiency to stop deforestation and to reduce methane emissions. The report reveals that the least effective ways to limit climate change are nuclear power and carbon capture and storage. Their figures show that in terms of cutting emissions, nuclear power and carbon capture and storage each have only 10 percent. Oops. <laughs> Thank you very much for for anybody who, if you had more to submit and didn't get to read it, please feel free to email us. Okay, um, Sid Bond is next, then Peter Dragonovich, Dra Dragovich, and Marv Rabinowitz.
<coughs> My name is Sid Bam, and I'm also here to talk about the minerals. I have been a Eugene and Eugene area resident since 1982. Although I've lived in the Eugene area for over 40 years, I grew up in Portland in the 1960s and early 70s. During that time, I observed the building of the Trojan nuclear power plant along the Columbia River northwest of Portland. Construction began in July of 1968, the summer before I started high school. On a clear day, we could look east and see Mount Hood or look northwest and see the Trojan Tower rising above the river. Finally, after years of construction delays and cost overrun in May of 1976, Trojan began generating commercial power. Portland General Electric was a two thirds owner of the plant and EWEB was a 30% owner. You may know the rest of the Trojan story, the citizen protests starting in 1977, increasing in 1978 after the plant was found to be on a major geological fault line and when public awareness of the problem of nuclear waste disposal was growing. A combination of citizen activism and Trojan's ongoing expensive maintenance and repair issues and leaks led to its permanent closure in 1993. Since EWEB is now considering returning to the use of nuclear power, something has changed in how you view the nuclear in industry. You see the new small modular nuclear reactors as somehow very different from Trojan or Hanford, but how different are they? The towers are 75 feet tall rather than the 500 foot height of Trojan. Smaller is easier to move and build, but are SMNRs safer? Don't they still generate the same kind of high level reactive nuclear waste as Trojan? An Oregon law wisely approved by voters in 1980 would have to be repealed or altered in order to allow a new nuclear power plant to be sited and built. New Scale, the Oregon-based SMNR company, was behind bills in the Oregon legislature that would have done away with the requirement to find an adequate repository for the disposal of nuclear reactive waste produced by their plants. In the 40 years plus since the statute was passed, the nuclear waste disposal problem has not been solved. The climate crisis we live in doesn't offer an excuse to create new public safety risks to solve the problems of rising global temperatures. Questions EWEB commissioners employees should be asking yourselves are, is nuclear power a solution to the issues of variable renewable energy, i.e. wind and solar? Will the nuclear industry operate its plants safely and cost effectively and solve its waste problem? Or will the solar industry, producer of real clean energy, develop battery systems capable of storing power generated during daylight to be available about the night. Taking a look at the battery storage systems for solar energy currently being developed may answer these questions. Thank you for your time. Okay, Peter Markovich, Mark Rabinowitz, then Jim Newton. Good evening, Commissioners. Peter Dragovich, EWEB Customer Award 5. Uh, I have a couple of comments about the IRP. Earlier versions of your IRP a few months ago had basically no reference to geothermal. The word occurred twice, uh, once in a dismissive sentence and the other time uh, in the glossary in the back of the IRP. Uh, since that time, geothermal has uh, been repeated. That word has been repeated more in the document, but it's in response to public comments that have been made encouraging that you look closer at geothermal. Uh, there have been um, some, and I'm sure you're aware of this, and I encourage you to look into this further, and if not into this IRP, put into future IRPs, that drilling technology has made very uh, significant gains to the point where drilling down six miles is feasible under commercially, uh, under $69 a, a megawatt, uh, commercially feasible to drill down six miles. What does that get? In most areas of the world, you can get down to uh, enough uh, heat under the uh, surface of the uh, earth uh, at three miles to make geothermal uh, feasible. So no longer is geothermal tied to geologic formations where heat is near the surface. And what that opens up a lot of possibilities, including siting geothermal 
at, for example, shuttered or scheduled to be shuttered coal plants where your transmission lines are already there. Uh, so I would urge you strongly to uh, look more closely at geothermal in the future. And then my only other comment on the IRP is uh, to take SMNRs out completely. That's, I think that's uh, off the table in my opinion. I think the public opinion uh, that I'm aware of supports that view also. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Stan Thompson was a physicist who lived in Eugene. And he said the most intolerable reactor may be one which comes successfully to the end of its planned life, having produced mountains of radioactive waste for which there is no disposal safe from earthquake damage or sabotage. A half century ago, EWEB sought a reactor north of Eugene and then planned a location in the tsunami zone north of Florence. After our citizens managed to defeat this plan, EWEB's leaders admitted that the defeat was good for the utility, and absolutely nothing has changed about boiling water with fission since then. There is no way to turn off radioactive waste except time, lots of it. New scale and all the other small modular nuclear reactor designs create the same array of fission products that their larger cousins create. We should have learned from WHOOPS in 1980s that reactors are a recipe for bankruptcy. When I first learned to use solar panels a third of a century ago, the first lesson was use less electricity. And this applies to the society, not just to the household level. In 2006, EWEB paid for Richard Heinberg to speak in Eugene, who was with Post Carbon Institute. Some of you may remember that. Um, since then, world population has increased by a billion and a half, more than the 1.2 billion the world had in 1859 when the first oil well was dug in Pennsylvania. Uranium is also in decline. Uranium mining peaked in the U.S. in 1980, and almost all of it is imported from places like Russia and Central Africa. Mining is not renewable. It's why gold mining ended in Cottage Grove. The ore is gone. It's a joke. Pretending that a reactor can solve the problem of boiling water with fission is psychological bargaining. We need acceptance that we live on a finite planet and need to adapt to constraints. Dr. John Goffman was a veteran of the Manhattan Project and first biomedical di director at Lawrence Livermore. And he said, quote, licensing a nuclear power reactor is licensing random premeditated murder because radiation produces cancer and the evidence is good all the way down to the lowest doses. I recently learned about Brandolini's law to quote, the amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than that needed to produce it. So you're going to get a half hour of song and dance on how wonderful new reactors would be that create the old waste but you need to give a lot more credence to the eight decades of reactor construction that has raised the background level of radiation on Earth. Next up, uh, then Mark, Stephen Baker, and then we'll go back to the people on the phone that are not available. All right. Mr. Podium, <laughs> EWIP Commissioners, General Manager and Staff. Small modular, modular reactors appear to be giving a new renaissance to the nuclear industry, branding them durable, reliable, prefabbed, and below ground. Although they would provide consistent base load power, the new scale design is the same as the Manhattan Project reactor, creating an endless life cycle of waste. The larger the reactor, the less costs are involved. According to the Lazard study, SMRs are more expensive than megawatt generated, 350 per per megawatt hour. There's also the threat of nuclear pro proliferation and accidents such as Three Mile, Fukushima, and Chernobyl. All of those sites are still contaminated. And again, the waste issue where SMRs create more waste than larger reactors. According to the DOE, existing conventional reactors create 
greater than 2,000 metric tons of radioactive waste per year with on-site storage because states do not want to become national depositories. New Mexico just passed legislation banning nuclear waste storage. Locally controlled power and storage should be the direction of EWEB and the IRP future plan. We need to establish 15 to 20 percent locally controlled power through green hydrogen and battery and through solar and battery utilizing residential and commercial rooftop as well as parking lot systems. Green hydrogen and storage is an alternative to nuclear provided that there is a sufficient water source and fossil fuels are not involved in the process. Another less expensive and shovel ready alternative to SMRs would be virtual power plants that could be funded by IRA and state funding. Virtual power plants are a network of battery systems that work in tandem generated by rooftop and community solar that can add megawatts of capacity to the grid when demand is the greatest. This is a continual source of power. According to an RMI forecast, U.S. potential for virtual power plant capacity by 2030 would be 62 gigawatts. 20 gigawatts or 32% from residential, 10 gigawatts or 16% from small battery storage, 17 gigawatts or 28% from EVs, and 15 gigawatts or 24% from commercial sourcing. There are currently thousands of virtual power plant community participants in California, Utah, and Vermont. In California, PG&E and Sunrun are producing 30 megawatts via 7,500 customers, and Sonnen and Baker Electric Home Energy by 2025 will produce 20 megawatts through 5,000 customers. In Vermont, a similar latitude as Eugene, Green Mountain Power is 4,000 battery customers, and in Hawaii, in coordination with Swell Electric, has an 80 megawatt BPP virtual power plant that serves three islands. There are working alternatives to expensive and forever nuclear waste of SMRs. Please consider renewables and locally controlled power sourcing. And thank you for this opportunity to speak and your attention. Okay. Okay, next up, um, Mark, uh, Stephen Baker, then I. I missed, sorry, Elliot Gray. Elliot Gray will be after Mark. Mark uh, Stephen Baker, uh, Board One, long time web customer. Uh, I'm strongly opposed to eWeb investing in potential nuclear energy projects for, that, for a number of reasons. EVO needs to invest in more renewable energy projects. Germany currently generates more than 50% of its electricity from renewable energy sources, wind and solar, and is easily able to manage the grid. Similarly, Denmark generates 55% of its electricity from renewable energy, mostly wind, and manages the grid. Renewable electricity generated from solar and wind by EWEB and BPA is much, much smaller share of electric generation than these countries produce now. So there's ample ability to add more renewable energy and still properly manage the grid and meet consumption requirements. Furthermore, EWEB and BPA have hydroelectric projects that can be used when needed to meet intermittent issues with electricity demands when needed. Well, needs to increase their investment in solar and wind projects. There are a number of promising technologies for stationary storage of electricity that are being developed, tested, and, and, and implemented. These storage systems allow electricity from solar and wind to be saved for later use to mitigate potential problems with the intermittent nature of solar and wind. As demonstrated by Germany and Denmark, these storage technologies are only needed when eWeb and EPA start to generate a much larger share of their electricity from wind and solar. So they are needed right now. EWeb should be tracking these electric storage developments. Consider participating in some trials. Finally, the U.S. still does not have an approved or operational nuclear waste facility. Oregon law prohibits new nuclear facilities unless a suitable waste facility has been built. Otherwise, EWEB staff and its board are skirting state law by investing in nuclear facilities in Washington. Also, EWEB board members making new investments in nuclear energy are just passing on these problems 
to their children and grandchildren. We live in an unstable world. Considering all the existing pools of spent nuclear fuel at power stations and how inviting these would be as potential terrorist targets, we don't need to create more of these. Thank you. And I just might add, I, I was an energy analyst at the Oregon Department of Energy for many years, and I worked on the uh, building. Uh, the reason we have a nature is because of it. But also, I, sometimes if you're interested, I can explain why the energy use of the building was twice what it should have been because of some mistakes made by the contractor and some decisions made at the time during construction. Thank you. <laughs> Elliot Gray, then we'll turn back to the phone. I have Kathy Ging, Daniel Noonan, and Craig Patterson. Elliot Gray, I live in Ward 1. I own commercial property in Ward 7 and Ward 5. And I'm going to go off script a little bit because of all the eloquent people that have been talking about nuclear waste. I'm going to say that I find it ironic that Web is talking about investing in, or in a feasibility study in a uh, technology that is completely untested at this point um, and uh, is unwilling to update its billing system so that it can take advantage of distributed solar solely because its IT system and its um, customer service system unwilling to update the system. Um, I've been in Eugene since before Trojan started and um, saw the promises of cheap, cheap energy, cheap clean power, and I saw the boondoggle that the taxpayers are still funding, and I saw that Westinghouse is still making crops from that. Um, Oregon voters banned nuclear power, um, and um, giant corporations are now trying to sell us clean, safe, unproven power. Um, there's only three small, uh, small modular reactors in the world that are in China, Russia, and India. The other ones, there are none. Um, the power that they're talking about selling us is the, the technology is just the same technology, only modified a little bit. Um, and they're trying to send, sell us that again. They have not changed and updated anything. Safety is all the same. Nuclear waste has not been filtered out. Let's talk about nuclear waste. Right now, Hanford is leaking, leaking into the groundwater. They don't know how to fix it. I've got papers right now to show you that. 45 feet under the ground, high level waste is going to last for 250,000 years. 250,000 years. They weren't Neanderthals. Get that. 250,000 years ago, Neanderthals weren't walking the earth. That's a long time ago. Low level nuclear waste is Chernobyl, 24,000 years. 24,000 years, 12 times longer than the Romans. And see that before Mesopotamia. That's low level nuclear waste. We're talking about commissioning nuclear reactors and creating waste we don't even know how to deal with. You guys are going to buy nuclear plants, create nuclear waste. We don't know how to deal with it. We're going to put it there, and our kids, 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 back 12, 12,000 years, don't know how to deal with it. Okay, moving back to the phone, let's see if Kathy Ging is now on. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Um, Kathy Ging, um, longtime Eugene resident and energy uh, concerned person. Thanks for your volunteer public stewardship. Are you best serving ratepayer owners by omitting an IERP volunteer citizen committee? I've watched citizen input attrition the last ERP had no public forum, this one no citizen committee. The last ERP committee I discovered via public records request and staff 
deliberately did not select any citizen in the solar energy academic or business fields, ignoring 250 years of local experience due to a possible conflict of interest, your PR person told me. How ludicrous. Solar radiation increased in this area 10 to 15 percent the 10 to 15 years before 2008 per UO Solar Energy Radiation Monitoring Lab, which you helped fund, by the way. Yet solar incentives and myopic policies were so effete that Mountain Rose would not install more solar electric cells some time ago. A discussion of nuclear energy and EWEB's future energy is egregious in this community. It should not be on the agenda. EWEB ratepayer owners have not been specifically informed about this issue in mainstream or social media or surveys. Conservation is still our major new hemp source. I mean, I think major new energy source. And hemp batteries, not fire prone, are in development. David Mitlin, M-I-T-L-I-N, has a patent. A recent documentary stated the sabotage of only nine U.S. power stations could dismantle the electric grid. Another issue of which we need to be cognizant is devast devastating earthquakes possibly here in the next 50 years. You may be aware that most health and hazard insurance companies exclude damage not only from earthquakes, injury, but also uh, insurance riders added the policy, but also um, exclude damage from nuclear disasters. Nuclear plants, including smaller units, could devastate tax bases and communities in which they are cited if accident occurred, in addition to leaving long-term brownfields, dead zones, burst of plants and wildlife, and adverse health issues, some of which we passed on to future generations. Besides the vulnerability of the grid, you know, some of these people are saying that the, the batteries, um, decentralized energy storage, including innovative battery technology, rapidly evolving because of uh, electric vehicles, can help with demand reduction, reducing reliance on need for firm power and capital intensive central power generating plants that can be attacked manually, et cetera. Uh, finally, I want to say that um, the Green State reported that uh, there are new plant-based batteries, which may be the solution to the problems generated by conventional batteries. Plant-based batteries uh, contain products of hemp plants, et cetera. Okay, I think that's all I have time for, but Read Small is Profitable by Rocky Mountain Institute, 207 Reasons Why Microenergy Plants Are Optimal for Our Energy Future. Thank you. Okay, Daniel Noonan and then Craig Patterson. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think you can hear me now. Um, Board President Carson and AWeb Commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to give testimony this evening and, and apologies for the technical difficulties. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Daniel Noonan and I'm a renter and resident of Ward 7. I'm also a climate and energy strategist for the local 501c3 nonprofit organization, Breach Collective. I wish I could be testifying this evening simply to congratulate uh, eWeb on its 2023 IRP. However, there are major shortcomings uh, contained within the IRP that I think are worth the board's attention. First, the IRP gives very little consideration to demand side investments, uh, specifically uh, weatherization upgrades and retrofitting of existing electric space and water heating with much more efficient uh, heat pump appliances would significantly mitigate the load increase from electrification that is forecasted to come from uh, widespread electric vehicle adoption. On a personal note, I am a renter currently residing in a poorly insulated dwelling. To accommodate for this lack of insulation and the resulting lack of passive heating and cooling, I've had to run my electric resistance heater nearly constantly through the coldest parts of the winter and run a portable AC unit that I purchased out of pocket uh, nearly constantly throughout the summer. Insulation upgrades and a heat pump system would resolve these problems for me uh, and greatly reduce my own demand on the grid and I'm convinced it would do the same for a number of houses as, as I've been a renter in, in Eugene for some time. It would also significantly lower my utility bill. 
Yet the IRP contains essentially no concrete plans to increase investment in these kinds of solutions beyond what currently exists for homeowners, uh, despite the significant state and federal funding being made available for these investments under the Inflation Reduction Act and other programs. Second, the IRP suggests that emiss the emissions reductions benefits of building electrification are primarily contingent on the composition of the electric grid. In fact, studies have shown that electrification with heat pumps uh, provides immediate advantages over sticking with gas at virtually any utility energy mix in the country today. And this is due to the massive efficiency advantages that heat pump appliances enjoy, enjoy even over the most efficient gas appliances. And this was demonstrated in the good company, the good company's electrification analysis that was prepared for the city of Eugene last year. Third, uh, the IRP seems to overemphasize the need to explore and invest in particular dispatchable energy sources, specifically small modular nuclear reactors and biomass. Uh, I am concerned about both of these, but particularly uh, small modular reactors, which I think as the testimony has shown tonight, have a number of uh, concerns associated with them to say the least. Uh, Portland General Electric's IRP is uh, illustrative in this area. Despite serving uh, approximately 10 times as many customers as eWeb, the IRP places minimal emphasis on this technology uh, relative to renewable energy storage and demand side measures discussed earlier. Uh, finally, most governments uh, and private interests promoting SMRs to date have been aligned with the fossil fuel and nuclear industries. Please take these comments into consideration. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Craig. Or, sorry, Daniel. Okay, and next up we have Craig. Is Craig on the line? Join. Yes, thank you for this opportunity. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in regards to the integrated resource planning effort. However, I believe there are some very substantial flaws in this effort and the document. First, I see very little real integration in this document regarding, in particular, conservation. Its effectiveness, its costs, its trends, and the need for far more reliable analysis. As the number one regional priority, conservation must take precedent. Questionable conservation accounting and huge disparities between BPA and the Power Planning Council offer little um, support that we can rely on what the numbers say. BPA has said that we have saved 2,357 2, megawatts historically, and the Power Planning Council says it's over 7,000, and there is no vetting for this substantial difference. So what have we learned from history? The energy shortfalls projected in the 60s and 70s led to whoops, the nuclear fiasco, where cost overruns stopped four of the five plants when costs soared from 325 million to 3.2 billion for the one completed plant number two. In the 70s, BPA raised its rates twice 28% in 74, these are the wholesale rates, and 88% in 79. And by 82, Peter Johnson, the, the head of BPA, was declaring that the deficit, the energy deficit was over, and that we now have a surplus. So much for modeling and projecting. Today at the Northwest Power Planning Council's regular meeting, a presentation by Elizabeth Soner, uh, Hosner, of Puget Sound Energy stated that nuclear energy was considered and eliminated from their projections going forward based only, mostly on the high costs. Their planning projections showed zero energy through 2040. The Power Planning Council applauded this. Meanwhile, the Columbia Generating Station, previous whoops, has said that the life of number two nuke plant was 20 to 30 years initially. However, given that the indebtedness for whoops will continue until 2044, 
they extended the life to reflect that time frame too. Never mind the leaking radiation from compromised tanks beginning to reach the Columbia and no permanent site for the waste. A power source too comprehensive to, com to comprehend. Integrated resource planning must understand history if we are to take climate change seriously. We must understand all the costs and liabilities which affect today and tomorrow, and thus nuclear and biomass. Pardon? Your three minutes are up. So oh. One last comment, and then we're, we're closing the public testimony for this evening. Okay, well, thank you then. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you all to have participated. We will now um, have some comments from commissioners should they choose to, which they're not required to. Um, I did want to just thank everybody uh, for coming and participating. And, uh, you know, this is part of the process. We put information out there. We want to hear all sides. And this is exactly why we didn't limit uh, conversation this evening, because we want to hear everything that you have to say. So. Thank you for taking time out of your busy evenings and coming down and sharing your thoughts and views with us. If you listen to it all, well, appreciate it. Um, I do have some questions. There were so many different things there. I'll raise them with staff based on some of the comments this evening, but I'll take that up with Frank in our um, questions later. So, do you else have anything to share? Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'd like to thank everybody too. Um, like. Uh, Commissioner Carlson said, we're uh, a late group that, that's elected here and it's input like this that we're not going to ignore. We're not going to just say thank you and go our own way. We're going to discuss this. We're going to get more educated on it. And I, I thank you. We've, done, we've been through processes like this with smart meters and other things such as that. So when we get challenged by the public, we will listen to the public. And whether or not whatever we come up with, I, I know that they're illegal in Oregon. I brought it up a long time ago, but We'll, we'll, we'll discuss this. I, I would hope that staff could contact, I think it was um, Dave McFarland from Upriver. It sounds like he needs some more information on the decision of why we have to tear that dam out, who's making us tear it down, and what our options are. And so hopefully he can uh, be contacted and we can educate him a little bit more, given the facts that we're working with. Thank you. Just take a moment um, and also say thank you to folks for coming out. Um, I had the same thought about Mr. Palmer, and, and if we have an ability to involve with him, I think that'd be super helpful. Um, as reiterating uh, Commissioner Brown's comment, we haven't made decisions. We're at the very start of evaluating options to address um, the gap in generation that's a decade or more away. Um, I think it's important to note that the peak demand that we're looking to address is in the winter, um, when solar generation is just not as, as productive. And the peak that we're trying to manage is a multi-week cold snap, not just the, the time between daylight. So it's um, not to say that solar isn't a part of the solution, but at the point we are in planning, I think it doesn't it doesn't fit the need that we're trying to solve for. Um, in my opinion, all forms of electric, I'm, I'm not saying that I'm, uh, uh, anyway, all forms of electric generation have a downside. So before we purchase new power of any kind, from my perspective, it's imperative that we take every opportunity to reduce energy first. And um, I think that is central in this plan. If you look at our plan, we are looking to do a conservation assessment to understand how much conservation is cost effective and we will do all of that. Um, so I, I, th I think that's an important step and I heard that voice from a few folks today. Um, and then lastly, the, given the costs of nuclear and the associated risks, I would like to see us evaluate every alternative before going down the, the, the road of adding more nuclear to our portfolio. And again, thank you all for taking the time to share your thoughts with us. Just on the point of, I mean, in the plan, nuclear doesn't even pop up as an option until 2042. So I know that we're, we're talking about it tonight. It's, it's not even modeled, which will get other information, but it's not in there until 2042, which, I mean, I would hope at that point we have lots of other technology options. Uh, Mindy. Um, thank you everybody for, for coming tonight. I think we know how to get people out to our public comments. <laughs> um, for that. 
Um, I just wanted to point out, piggybacking on what Matt said about energy efficiency and things like that, we have scheduled at our next board meeting that we're going to have a presentation on energy efficiency programs for renters. So that's something that we've been talking about a lot. The board has been asking about and um, just to add to our repertoire of, of things that we can do, but we're going to have a, a presentation next month on that topic. Great. Frank. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I'm the one to blame, I guess, for uh, for causing so much attention, a part of it. Um, but I'll, I'll really say, you know, a number of people have asked us to take nuclear off the table. And part of the reason it's in is that we're looking at a portfolio, which is a mix of resources. Uh, and to keep all options on the table in order to make decisions as things evolve. Uh, this doesn't mean that we're going to build a plant in Coburg next month, but in order to evaluate all the choices, you have to leave them on the table and then evaluate their social, their economic, and, and their environmental impacts. And that's the reason it's in the plan, um, was because I could look at every single resource and start pulling them out. Because we have advocates show up and say, get get rid of the Snake River dams, get rid of other, other technologies as well. So it's in there. But I would also point out that the reason we have an IRP is to look at a long-term view, but to pull that back to near-term actions. And the first three actions listed are the Bonneville contract, conservation and energy efficiency and demand response uh, of which this is not an or situation these are ands and so a lot of the things that people have asked for are in there um, the fact that we mentioned future technologies that we want to keep an eye on and understand as we go forward i i don't think diminishes the fact that the near-term actions focus on those on those two things uh, and so that that would be I, we'll get to that we'll hear more information uh, about the technology, we'll hear more information about the integrated resource plan and, and where we're taking that later. Um, staff will present that. So um, anyway, I appreciate the feedback as well. OK, well, we will close the uh, public hearing and we will move on to the next uh, action items. We have approval of consent calendar A. Do you want to pull anything from consent calendar A? Do we adopt consent calendar A? Okay. All in favor of adopting, uh, all in favor of the motion, uh, say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Consent calendar B. Does anybody want to put something from Please item seven. Okay. A motion for the remainder of seven. Remainder. Adopt consent calendar B, absent mind number seven. Thank you. All right. All those in favor, uh, minus seven, please say aye. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, um, so item number seven is $1.6 million over seven years for environmental permitting and services related to the second second source treatment plant. And this is this is just for for my being a, a newer person on the boards. I, I, I'm still pulling that card out as a newer person on the board. I know that later on in the in the evening, we're going to be going over the capital improvement uh, plan and the long term financial plan. And I'm just wondering, has this board committed or a, or a previous board committed to second source plan? Uh, it's a hundred million dollar commitment, and I'm just I don't recall doing that. This consent calendar is $1.6 million towards that. It's obviously in the early stage of planning and permitting, but I don't know. I'm, I'm just looking to staff to find out is like we had with Lieberg, is there a, a time frame where we do that or is it when we approve the capital improvement plan later on? And if that's the case, you know, there were there were several different uh, scenarios put forward there as far as the long term financial plan. There was ones with with the second source and ones without the second source. And by putting this in the consent calendar, that's kind of to me putting the cart in front of the horse a little bit. I just need a little input from staff on this. Yeah, I think certainly through the last few years, um, in particular, uh, I'm going to say probably a year or two before you joined the board, uh, when we brought forth the timeline and the the scope of the second source, uh, the board at that time 
blessed the uh, the approach to a second source. Um, at that point, um, we started including it. Uh, we are doing preliminary work to understand scope and, and design. Um, and the reason it's presented with alternatives it isn't so much for the alternative, but to understand the impact of, of that particular. It's a, such a large project to segregate out that particular impact on um, customer owner rates. Okay. Um, that's helpful. And I guess the only concern that I would have is, again, I, I respect previous boards that, that gave that direction forward. That previous board gave directions and forward at a $70 million price tag. Uh, we're looking at almost a $100 million price tag now. So again, it might be something that this board would like to at least talk about. I think we can later on in, in the capital. But that was one of the reasons. I just wanted to be clear where we were as far as the decision making process. So with that, I would move to approve consent calendar. B's item seven. Second. Any more discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Okay, we will move now to uh, we have advanced nuclear presentation. All right, good evening. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> All right. Uh, well, hey, uh, happy to be here tonight. My name is Greg Cullen. I'm the Vice President of Energy Services and Development for Energy Northwest. Um, I've been with Energy Northwest just over 29 years now and uh, in a variety of different roles. Uh, right now I lead the organization that really does uh, uh, everything, everything but operate Columbia Generating Station for the most part. So if you can go to the next slide. Uh, a little bit about Energy Northwest, uh, maybe uh, everyone's very familiar, but I know some might not be. So Energy Northwest is a not-for-profit municipal corporation. Uh, we are public power, just like uh, you are. Uh, we are a uh, joint operating agency of the state of Washington. Uh, our membership is, is uh, made up of public utility districts and municipalities in the state of Washington uh, by statute. Um, however, if you go to the next slide, uh, participants in our projects um, are not limited to our members. So we have uh, uh, 93 participants in six different states in our generating projects. Go to the next slide. Uh, this is the look at our uh, generating portfolio. Um, we are proud that it's 100% clean. Um, and I like to kind of talk through this slide real quickly to kind of point out the White Bluff Solar Station, the lower left. 38 kW these days is pretty darn small, but back when we put that online in the year 2000, that was uh, sort of an early first of its kind utility scale solar demonstration. Um, the Nine Canyon Wind Project at the top, uh, the first phase went online in 2002 and subsequent phases. Again, early development of wind in the state. In fact, I like to kind of uh, point out that we actually were so early in wind development that we had a wind project shut down by the state of Washington. So um, at the very bottom, you'll see the Horn Rapid Solar Storage and Training Project. That's one that we put online about two and a half years ago in conjunction with a grant from the Washington State Department of Commerce, four megawatts of solar, uh, one megawatt, four megawatt hours of battery with that. Again, sort of a first of its kind and size in the state. So uh, we do have a history of helping develop newer technologies, especially clean energy technologies, be a leaders in that area. We're obviously best known for operating climate generating station. Um, and we do have uh, uh, Packwood Hydro. We have other hydros that we operate and maintain uh, for other utilities, including Stone Creek's Creek Hydro that we uh, help maintain for your organization. Uh, we are developing a, a solar project right now that's uh, about 127 and a half megawatts. Uh, the Ruby Flat Solar Project, and so we're in process on that project. Expect that up and running, uh, hopefully in 2024. Next slide. So why are we studying nuclear energy? Uh, we first had utilities approach us in 2010. Uh, requesting that we uh, perform a study, a feasibility study. The time that really led us to uh, uh, partnering with UAMPS on their uh, project with the new scale technology. We spent a better part of the decade uh, helping new scale develop their technology as well as UAMPS develop their project. 
Uh, but in 2019, uh, we commissioned a study. Next slide, please. Uh, a study uh, using energy environmental economics or E3. Uh, you're probably familiar with them. They do a lot of uh, some of the most respected studies in the region around looking at things like resource adequacy and, and how a system works. Uh, we commissioned this study to kind of follow on some of the other work that had been performed in the region. If you go to the next slide, when uh, when we uh, looked at the final results, if, if you're if you're talking about it, we were able to the Clean Energy Transformation Act had been passed in Washington State by this time, so we were able to incorporate those requirements. When you look at trying to be 100% clean by 2045, uh, which is the Washington State requirement. Um, we uh, went through different series of op options for the models to look at, and I don't have to talk you through a lot of this. I know your integrated resource plan does similar analysis, but simple, simple answer is what we saw when you look at things from a system perspective um, that that the uh, system uh, costs were much, much lower when you had clean firm resources uh, such as small modular reactors in the mix. And it's quite a bit cheaper in this case uh, by providing those options to the models that saved almost $8 billion per year relative to just doing it with renewables and energy storage alone. Next slide. So that really led us to kind of conclude that this was the right mix for the region going forward, um, that we know wind and solar and, and storage. And as we said, we've been heavily involved in developing that, um, do have a place. Uh, we do believe we need to keep the existing hydro in the region. Uh, we think Columbia Generating Station uh, could operate another 20 years. So we just we did ex uh, renew its license for 20 years and um, that program is built to make sure the plant is reliable and safe. And we believe there's plenty in place to show that we can do that another 20 years. And then uh, uh, we do believe new nuclear will be needed in the mix. Next slide. So I was asked to kind of talk a little bit about the state of nuclear right now, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the activities as far as federal support. Uh, next slide. In uh, in 20, January 2020, Congress directed uh, DOE to form the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, and they provided initial appropriations uh, for that, pro uh, that program. Uh, and that was really to build two new reactors in this country by the end of the decade, with the federal government paying half of the cost. Uh, so that process uh, was put in place in May, a uh, quick, quick turnaround by DOE. Um, and they went through the application process and by October had selected the two technologies that would, would be eligible for that. Uh, the two technologies chosen were X Energy and TerraPower. TerraPower, of course, is Bill Gates technology that uh, is based in, in Bellevue, Washington. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those technologies in a minute. Um, in the same week that those awards are handed out, uh, the federal government did provide an award to UAMPS for their new scale project. So the three uh, technologies that were sort of chosen by the federal government, if you will, to provide this most significant funding to are the new scale technology, the X Energy and TerraPower technologies. Uh, later in 2021, November of 2021, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, did front fund the ARDP for the first five years of that. Uh, that's a very rare occurrence to see things done like that, but it did. Um, the In January 22, as part of the, uh, as directed by the uh, Infrastructure Act, uh, the DOE formed the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration to manage the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Project and other early technology deployments. And in August 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act was signed into law. If we go to the next slide. Uh, many are familiar with a lot of things out of the Inflation Reduction Act, but you may, may not be familiar that the uh, production tax credits and investment tax credit options in, in that were now for the first time uh, nuclear was eligible for those. Uh, you can get a $30 megawatt hour uh, for the first 10 years production tax credit or a 30% investment tax credit. Uh, there's also an increaser of 10% for each of those related to sufficient domestic content, which we believe right now that uh, uh, the X Energy technology, the, the three basically chosen for federal awards would, would likely meet this because those awards also basically require a lot of that already. Um, also, for the first time, I'm sure you're aware the uh, IRA included the ability for public uh, non-federal tax liability entities to receive direct pay options for those tax credit and get access to that. So we have the opportunity to do that for the first time as do you. 
And it also included uh, an increase in the uh, loan program office funding, uh, author include an uh, increase in the authorization for lending, but also funding for a uh, loan and loan fees and closing costs. And, and that provides that they have a whole program around nuclear as it provides a significant low cost of money opportunity for nuclear as well. Next slide. In March of this year, the Department of Energy issued this report, um, and I encourage you to go look for that if you've not seen this. Uh, the, you know, the, the, the report basically concluded that if we're going to be successful as a country uh, with our decarbonization efforts, we're really going to probably need about 200 gigawatts of new nuclear in the system. Um, just to give you some uh, you know, point of reference there, the current fleet in the US makes up about 100 gigawatts right now. So you're talking about tripling the nuclear capacity in the US. Uh, and that's really, again, based on the, the federal government's analysis of meeting decarbonization goals. Another aspect that's come out in, in touched on a little bit in this report, but has come out even more since then is, you know, that as, as was talked about by one of the commenters, you know, China and Russia are developing new nuclear technologies and selling them around the world. And, and there's real concerns about allowing, uh, about us abdicating our leadership role in nuclear safe, nuclear operation and regulation, as well as as the influence that that gives them in those countries. And so the federal government has also recognized that that uh, needing to have advanced nuclear technologies to compete around the world is actually a national security issue as well. So this has led to a lot of uh, intense focus just over the last few months in Washington, D.C. about what additional support is needed to uh, to to get this lift off going. All right, next slide. Let me talk a little bit about the technologies. Obviously, this is going to be a very quick flyover with the limited time I have and happy to come back and talk in more depth if you're interested. Um, but I will focus initially on the three technologies that were funded by the federal government. So the first one, if you go to the next slide, is the TerraPower technology. It's a uh, sodium fast reactor, sodium cooled fast reactor. Uh, it's basically the design is a single reactor that can put out at 100% power, puts out about 345 megawatts, um, but it has between the uh, reactor and the turbine generator and the steam generator and then the turbine generators, it has a molten salt energy storage system. And so the energy that's used to create the steam and the steam generators is, is actually uh, from the energy storage system. And so the, the intent at this point is to, to have the, the generator basically rated at 500 megawatts, or it could be more than that. But And so you have the ability to basically ramp up and down using the energy storage system uh, to create your actual output while you leave the reactor basically at 100% power. Um, many of you are familiar with that Pacific Core has included this in their integrated resource plan and in their most recent plan actually went from one of these deploying one of these to deploying three of these in in really the next uh, 10 to 15 years and their first one is planned for a former coal site in in uh, Cameron Wyoming. Next slide. Just another close up of that you know basically the reactor island nuclear island has the reactor and then the molten uh, salt is heated up inside the reactor building so only the molten salt is what leaves and goes over to the steam generator and the storage system um, and uh, again while while we talk about a lot of these being advanced or new new nuclear uh, the uh, this design is based on the fast flux test facility a doe demonstration reactor that operated for decades uh, just north of richland washington here in tri-cities next slide uh, the X Energy technology is a high temperature gas cooled reactor. It uses helium as it's not really a coolant, it's really more of a heat transfer mechanism. And it uses triso fuel, and I'll talk a little bit more about triso fuel on the next slide. Um, this is a very modular approach. Each module is about 80 megawatts electric, and you can put anywhere from one to 12 modules on the common control room and other infrastructure. Uh, they're designed for 60 year life, but quite frankly, these are, these are going to be. Um, 100 year assets because it's very simple and and relatively cheap to replace any components in this system uh, they're they're made in factories and brought to the site uh, many of the components including the turbine generator is sec you know basically the secondary sides are off the shelf uh, just like what you would put in a combined cycle natural gas plant uh, one thing that's unique about this technology compared to others is that it's a continuous online refueling 
and uh, you'll maybe understand that a little more when I talk about the fuel in the next slide. But that, uh, from a utility standpoint, what's nice about that is it moves the fuel in from being a, a fixed cost to a variable cost. So if at some point we decide to operate a reactor like this as a flexible resource to to pair with renewables and and uh, and just firm up the system. Uh, when you're not operating, you're saving on fuel, unlike uh, most other reactor designs. Uh, like all of these, there, it's considered walk away safe, uh, meaning that there's nothing for operators to have to do to keep it safe with it shutting down safely. Uh, they're based on passive safety systems, uh, but one that X Energy really has and adds is the is the claim of meltdown proof as well. And again, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, the the main advantage of the smaller ones and with particularly the X-Energy and new scale technologies is the more modulized approach that I've already talked about, the ability to ship those uh, on rail or, or road. Next slide. So again, what's unique about the X-Energy is the fuel. Um, it's a, it's triso fueled, uh, tristructural isotropic is what that's short for. Um, basically what this is, is uranium kernels are encased in uh, five layers of different forms of carbon, graphite, uh, and and there's about 18,000 of those kernels in a single pebble. Uh, the pebble is also encased in layers of carbon graphite, and uh, those 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 uh, shell layers cannot melt at any temperature the reactor could reach or create. And therefore, basically, again, you cannot melt the fuel. The, the concern with, with nuclear is always if you overheat the fuel, you can melt the outside and release the radionuclides or fission products to the environment. In this case, you basically uh, eliminated that possibility. Next slide. Uh, the new scale technology is probably one you're a little more familiar with. Again, it's uh, really a, a still a light water cooled reactor, uh, really sort of a, a modernized shrunken version of the pressurized water reactors that operate the existing fleet and very similar really to what's operated safely in the US submarine and aircraft carrier fleet for decades. Um, it's uh, basically you can build, you have to build this reactor building for how many modules you want to be able to add. Uh, they're offering anywhere four, six or 12 uh, module building size. Um, right now they, they have upgraded their reactors to put out 77 megawatts electric per module. So very similar in output to the uh, uh, X energy size. Uh, again, a 60 year design life. These do require refueling uh, outages and right now there'd be an 18 month refueling outage and cycle. Uh, like a lot of these, what we're seeing with the more passive systems and simplified systems and approaches, it needs far fewer uh, control of operators to manage the units safely. Again, walk away safe because all the cooling systems and new scale system are passive. Um, and again, modulized components can be built off site and transported via rail. Um, one quick item for uh, for this technology that I do want to highlight is, you know, they uh, if you go to the next slide, while while they have uh, basically achieved some some licensing progress, you know, what was what was approved by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was a 12 module reactor building with 50 megawatt modules, and um, and now what they intend to build for UMPs and uh, design and build for UMPs is a six module building uh, with 77 megawatt modules and so that will require some additional approvals by the NRC to look at both the upgraded modules as well as the six module buildings and that combination uh, so that they still have uh, still have some work to do on from a licensing standpoint to get those combinations approved so that's kind of a quick flyover there's a there are some other technologies out there including general electric has um, a boiling water reactor uh, 300 megawatt version uh, it's, it's basically a smaller version of Columbia Generating Station, but with modernized and simplified and passive safety systems. Uh, Ontario Power Generation in Canada, in Canada has chosen this technology to build for power uh, electricity purposes um, and tends to have their reactor online by the end of the decade. Tennessee Valley Authority has picked this technology as well, as well and is working down the path of licensing uh, some sites in Tennessee there for this technology. Uh, Westinghouse, the AP1000 is what was built down in Georgia. Those are just coming online now, uh, but they also have recently announced an AP300, a smaller, obviously 300 megawatt version of that design. Again, these are being built very successfully and, and on schedule, on budget in China. Um, and uh, there's a lot that can be learned from that as well as, as, well as the recent experience. Um, but we do see obviously a lot more focus on the smaller sizes these days.
Uh, Holtec is a company you may not have heard of. They have another uh, pressurized water reactor and simplified design of 160 megawatts. Uh, Kairos Power has a unique design. It, it's sort of a, a little bit of a mix between the X Energy and the uh, Terra Power in a way. It uses a fluoride salt uh, coolant, um, but then uses the triso pebble fuel like X Energy. Um, and uh, the one unique thing about both the, the X Energy, the uh, Terra Power, and the Kairos Power is they do use produce higher temperature steam than the water cooled reactors, um, which has uh, potential advantages of Ontario power generation. While they chose the D GE technology for for electricity generation, did choose the X Energy technology for process heat applications in their province, be partly because of that. And then there are micro reactors as well. Right now, we don't see that micro reactors will probably ever be economical for standard uh, utility use. Um, without a lot more progress, but they right now are likely to be very uh, attractive for remote uh, remote villages, remote industrial operations, or even like remote military bases, say in uh, Alaska or, or northern Canada or other areas like that. Next slide. Um, what are we seeing around the, in, the region as far as interest and discussions on nuclear? You know, the investor owned utilities in our region have a serious challenge in front of them, right? 80% uh, clean by 2030 in both Oregon and Washington. You talk to the investor owned utilities and most of them, when you ask them where are they today, they'll give you numbers in the around 30 or lower 30% clean range uh, with, you know, six and a half years left to go. So a lot of work to do. So we are, we have had some very serious interest from investor owned utilities about this. We talked already about Pacific Core and what they're doing with the Terra Power project, um, but we are seeing it appearing in their integrated resource plans um, in many of them as they start to uh, realize that they're going to need something like this in the system to be successful. Uh, the Bonneville Power Administration customers that are, are even looking are looking ahead to the new contracts and are expecting to be at or over their high water mark. Um, are very seriously exploring something like this. We have uh, somewhere around 11 utilities that have sent us letters of interest and have even provided some funding of our feasibility study uh, because of their concerns about where they're going to find power that's going to be both compliant with the uh, clean energy requirements as well as, uh, as firm and reliable. Uh, so we have uh, quite a bit of interest from that portion of BPA customers. And of course, I know I don't need to tell you that you know BPA power cannot be used for new large single load. So we've had conversations with several uh, uh, industrial companies that uh, that are looking to bring new large single loads to the region. Um, and uh, you know, I think to quote one of the uh, one of these industrial companies uh, uh, said, you know, your state lied to us. They told us come here. There's all this great clean, uh, affordable hydropower. They didn't tell us that it was all spoken for. And I think that's, you know, kind of a, a really good summary of the state of the industry right now for uh, for industrial development in our states um, is right now there's, you know, we're talking a lot about how do we replace the the, the fossil fire generation for the loads that we have already. Um, but if we want any form of industrial development, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest from those uh, uh, areas because there's really no other option that's going to provide the 24-7, 365 power they need. I think, let's see, next slide. Um, so yeah, just for, for what we're exploring right now, we are looking at the possibility of putting a, an X energy reactor on our one of our sites that has an unfinished reactor right next to the Columbia Engineering Station. Uh, so far, we've received about 247 megawatts of letters of interest for that project. Um, we have another 480 megawatts that have been indicated to us from an investor owned utility as far as interest um, that they're talking to us about and performing a pretty deep dive on. Uh, there's another 95 megawatts of interest from a public utility that has been uh, indicated in one uh, form to us, but not in a formal letter of interest at this point. And then there's another utility working with one of their industrial customers that has put out a, a request for information and a press proposal for 150 megawatts that 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 it has to be very clean, very firm, very very 24/7 reliable. So just a just a sense of what we've what we've had uh, as far as outreach to us. There's there's numbers far beyond this as far as the conversations we've had, but this is what we've had as far as as uh, what I would call some form of of structured. Uh, uh, indication of exact need and interest. So that's a very quick flyover. I think that's the last slide I had, but happy to take any questions if there's any time remaining. I wanted to 
to jump in? Uh, I thank you for that presentation. So I don't know very much at all about Ehir and uh, Ehir Park. Um, how far off are we as the industry from having a plant like this up and running, or is are they already up and running? The UAMS project uh, and the uh, X, X Energy projects are expect still right now projected to be online in 2029 or by 2030. Uh, Terra Powers uh, uh, and Pacific Core are talking similar numbers right in that range. Um, you know, again, whether we can actually achieve that or not is yet to be seen. But right now, those projects are considered to be on track for around around 2029. Um, the uh, the uh, the GE BWR uh, project in Ontario, uh, they're talking 2028. It's kind of their target right now um, and, and moving pretty heavily down that path as well. So again, whether we'll actually achieve those is yet to be seen, but uh, those are the targets right now when we would expect. So right around 2030 is kind of what we're expecting to see. Um, they're, they're, none of these technologies are up and operating right now. As I said, they're all based on previous designs, so they're not they're not something that we worry about. We don't don't know how they're going to work or if they're going to work. Uh, China has started up some high temperature gas reactors recently that are very similar to the X Energy design, um, and uh, so that that's you know something that we have seen operated around the world recently. Um, and another question I have is about storage. Of the fuel. Okay. So I actually have some slides. If you can keep going for a minute here, there's some slides uh, sort of at the end of the presentation here um, that might help with this discussion. If you'll just keep going and I'll try to tell you when to stop. All right, stop right there. If you go back one. So um, right now, I'm sorry, go forward one more. <laughs> So this, these are spent fuel casts at Columbia Generating Station. Uh, this is what they look like. One thing I do want to be very clear uh, from some of the conversations, um, there are a lot of a lot of things that weren't accurate. But one in particular, you know, this is what the waste look, storage uh, for fuel looks like. Um, the, the Columbia Generating Station has nothing to do with what happened at Han uh, what's at Hanford. That's all uh, waste production, or excuse me, weapons production waste. Um, and cleanup efforts from you know the early days of weapons production. Uh, so this is what storage of spent fuel looks like. It's solid. It's never in a liquid form. It doesn't leak because it's all solid and it sits in these casts. These casts are designed to uh, withstand earthquakes or 747 impacts, um, and they're designed that if they did fall over an earthquake, nothing happens anyway. Um, they just basically sit on a concrete pad. Um, I tell people that, uh, you know, number one, I've 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 lived i for almost 30 years in the Tri Cities. I've raised two children who were born here and lived their entire lives here. I would have my children stand next to and even hug these casts because there's just no uh, radiation coming out of them. Um, if you go to the next slide, if you look at all of the waste for the commercial industry in the U.S. that's been created over its entire life. It would fit on a football field and 20 feet high, and that's kind of what this blue, large blue box represents. That's a lot. Um, if you Why? look over, if you look over in the corner, you'll see kind of what what has resulted from Columbia Generating Station. So we know how to store this safely. Uh, we we know you know there's been a lot of conversation. We absolutely 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 do need a permanent repository for this, but we know how to store it safely. I, I will tell you that, you know, as was mentioned earlier, every technology has its downsides. As I mentioned, we operate wind and solar and batteries and our solar project, uh, the panels are failing. Uh, they have mercury in them, they have other chemicals in them, and we don't have a, we don't know where we're supposed to store those right now uh, that's safe as well. Um, so in the next slide too, if you look, you know, the other thing that we do need to talk more about in this country is, is the possibility for recycling used fuel. There's a lot of value and energy left in the fuel. Uh, we've been working recently with a company called Curio that is using some lab proven technologies to, uh, to, uh, to try to develop a commercial venture. They believe it's commercially viable to recycle the fuel. And if you go to the next slide, uh, when they're when they're done, you have 4% remaining volume left. The rest is all reused. Um, and you've that 4% remaining has a 
300 years to background level of radiation instead of the longer periods that we're talking about earlier. So this is something else that we need to uh, be talking about in this country. This is a uh, uh, proliferation resistant. Uh, that's not a concern. And so this is something else we need to talk about. There's better things we can do than just store it in a permanent repository. I'm curious, so on the, the storage of the fuel um, and the cost, what's the time frame that's put into your cost the metrics? Like if you do an MPV analysis on the cost of one of these plants, do you include the way, the cost of the waste storage and over what time frame? So the work we've done, I'll just focus on the X Energy technology because that's the one we've spent the most detailed analysis on. Um, the plant design includes uh, on-site storage. It's it's kind of below grade storage system that's all built into the site for how you would store that. Um, and so it, it's designed to have that storage built for all the fuel you would create in a 60 year life and can store there for really an uh, unlimited period of time until a repository is built. Um, the, uh, the nuclear uh, licensing process. It is required if you're operating a nuclear plant that you be funding uh, nuclear waste storage eventually, and so that's factored into the cost estimates as well as the cost of decommissioning. Uh, it's another thing that's kind of unique to nuclear compared to a lot of technologies is that you, they are required by law to fund for decommissioning as part of the, the project and as part of your annual costs. So, so there's, there's no time frame necessarily that's built into it. It's just until there might be a an additional facility built? Right. I mean, there'd be no additional cost, basically, because that storage is all built in, so it can be stored on site safely, and that all is factored into the costs. Um, I mean, so case, over time, anything deteriorates. How do you deal with the deterioration of the material that's around that waste? Well, like I said these are kind of below grade, uh, kind of built in, so they're it's not the same as even what I showed you with the above ground casks. Um, I think it's a, a good question. I don't have the numbers on exactly how long those intend to be qualified for. I agree with you. It's probably in hundred years, not thousands. Um, but it is built in the ability to move those out there. It's designed such that if that when there is a permanent repository, um, you're able to move those out and into transportation casts to move them to the uh, permanent repository. So you'd have the same ability to use that capability to move into new casts, storage casts if you need to. So what if there isn't ever a singular depository? Then at some point you'd have to just uh, you know, move them into newer casks, you know, maybe about again above ground system like at Columbia or something else. But uh, um, again, it's not really it's just more of a time issue down the road, probably hundreds of years down the road or one or two hundred years down the road before you'd have to really deal with something like that. Can the waste that's already been enclosed in these casks be recycled as you're talking about? Yeah, the waste, the waste for the existing fleet, that's exactly what Curio is targeting is, is recycling that waste, so it absolutely can be. Right, and uh, in terms of the material needed that's mined, how do you, where do you get the new mining material from and how much is needed versus how much we actually have on the planet available? Yeah, so the uranium is really very plentiful. Um, the reason there was some conversation or comment earlier about, you know, reduction in uranium mining, and that's really, really because in the US, um, there was so much plentiful uranium around the world that that it just was too expensive to mine in the US. So most of the US mining has been sort of uh, scaled back just because of competitiveness. Again, there's an opportunity here to uh, uh, to, to to gain uranium out of the used fuel as well and, and uh, reuse that. Um, what I will tell you is from our analysis, again, as we look at all different technologies from our analysis, we're far more concerned about the mining issues around lithium and some of the, the metals needed or the materials needed for solar um, and batteries than we are uranium as far as, uh, as, far as availability and econ or environmental impact from the mining process. Hey, thanks uh, so much for the presentation. This is uh, su super helpful for me. Um, I have a question about the the anticipated costs. You were talking about the savings compared to other 
sources of generation. And my question is around uh, our assumed costs for, per megawatt hour, um, given that there aren't any uh, small scale reactors functioning in the US yet. Um, I'm curious how you come to the cost estimate and what your current cost assumption is. So we were X Energy uh, does has done most of the cost analysis around the specific technology and, and they hired two different constructing partnerships last year and have worked with them pretty extensively to to leverage their experience around estimating what it's going to take to to build and construct these. Um, and so we use uh, they just provided an update and updated their estimates based on that work as well as bringing it into 2023 dollars. Uh, we have built a cost model that allows us then to take other aspects and pull it into that uh, around that to sort of come up with a final LCOE. Um, what we're seeing right now is, uh, um, you know, somewhere on the order of around $80 a megawatt hour for our project is our estimate. Um, we are, however, as I mentioned earlier, working with the federal government on uh, opportunities for additional support from the federal government, both in terms of trying to reduce that number sum as well as um, as as providing some sort of uh, risk cap, if you will. Uh, you know, it's interesting to think about the subsidies that that uh, wind, solar, and batteries have received over the last 30 years, um, and um, and and so we're looking to kind of get some some subsidies as well for the nuclear to bring those early project costs down so we can get the cost curve reduced and, and continue forward uh, with getting this launched. So we don't think the story is yet written on what these final costs are going to look like um, when all is said and done, but that's our current estimate is around the $80 a megawatt hour. Um, I should mention again our solar project that we're developing um, over the last year or so as we brought in it into $2023 has gone from being uh, estimated at just under $40 a megawatt hour to now being estimated over $62 a megawatt hour. And we're also not done with uh, those costs as well and have some supply chain concerns around um, timing on getting the panels as well. So we're seeing that, you know, in all technologies that their uh, costs are going up uh, over the last couple of years in particular. Thank you. That's helpful. Another question around water use. Um, these are thermal systems, right? So they they're they're consuming water or they're they're using water and heating water in the process, right? Are they, these the smaller scale systems are do they use water at the same rate that a conventional large reactor does? So you know the I guess. For the most part, I'm going to tell you the answer is yes, uh, because most reactors, the water usage is really limited to the secondary side. So it you know depends on your cooling mechanism on the secondary side. So it really has nothing to do with the reactor itself. Um, for example, Columbia Generating Station, you know, the the does not have to really use water as far as the reactor coolant systems. It's only the water that, that that's taken out of the river is really to use for the uh, cooling tower system. So, you know, megawatt hour to megawatt hour, you're talking about similar water usage for wet cooling. However, we do have the opportunity here and what we've been studying quite hard, heavily with our project would be using dry cooling systems. Um, those we use about one hundred one one hundredth one percent of the water that um, that it would use for wet cooling system. And even if you set it up as sort of a hybrid system where there can be some uh, supplemental I mean, cooling with water during the um, during the heat hottest months of the year, it's still a very, very small fraction of what's used there. So that's something we've studied very significantly with the higher temperature steam. Um, you don't really take as much of an efficiency hit. Um, there's a little bit additional cost up front for that equipment, but we think that's that's worth it to avoid the water usage. And also with using the dry cooling, you, you're not putting any heat in the river as well. Yeah, thanks. That's the question I had was around the, the thermal pollution in, in waterways and, and what the contribution was. But it sounds like if there if there is dry cooling options that it reduces the thermal pollution load. Yeah, it, for the river in particular, yep. Thanks. Okay, John Brown. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Um, most of my questions have been answered, but what about distribution? Given the limitations on the transmission capacity, do you have to locate, are these new facilities going to have to be located in close proximity to existing facilities or repurposed facilities, or do you have some magic way to get through the limitations on the distribution? 
Well, I guess what I would tell you is I think this technology is the best fit for our transmission and distribution challenges. Um, you know, the, the the problem we have right now, of course, is as we try to, which we're trying to develop the renewables, obviously they can't be located in our metropolitan areas and, and they're best located in areas like ours over here in the Tri-Cities where we have more sun and more wind. And so that's generally what we're looking at. But then as we spread them out, um, you know, then you have to have significant transmission to try to gather all that together. You know, I like to point out that if 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 we if we multiplied the number of turbines in the in the Columbia River Gorge by 100, um, you know, that doesn't help us one bit if the wind's not blowing in the gorge. So you do require geographical diversity uh, for wind and, and solar as well to make sure that somewhere you're you're getting that generation when you need it. Um, but it's it's and 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 that requires then of course a significant transmission. Here we have the opportunity. It's much more energy dense. You have the opportunity to put it where you need it. Um, Bonneville Power Administration gave us a presentation at one of our board meetings recently and talked about their transmission challenges. Um, they they gave a slide at the end, uh, un unsolicited, but but threw in a slide that said, you know, where the top locations in their mind would be for small modular reactors based on transmission needs. And our site next to Columbia Engineering Station was one of the top ones on their list. Obviously, you think about like the uh, retiring coal plant in uh, Centralia, Washington, where you you know you're taking 1400 plus megawatts of, of firm capacity offline. Uh, you know, obviously that's a, a prime location from a transmission standpoint where you can use that land, existing land, existing resources to uh, to site a, a, a dense project like this. Um, and so there are others like that that they've identified that would be great places to to put energy dense stuff like this in and and solve really eliminate the need for a lot of transmission build out. And so that's another cost consideration that that goes into the overall analysis. Thank you. Um, thanks. Most of my questions have been answered, except for I think I'm going to go back to one of the ones that Matt mentioned about the uh, cost per megawatt hours. As you said, we were <laughs> 80. Did that include the the subsid the federal subsidies that you mentioned with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and some of these other ones. Is that factored into that or is, would that drive that down? Yeah, no, our, our analysis does include and that one particularly was using the investment tax credit. Although I will tell you that um, we had some early information that the investment, the, the tax credits for the direct pay option that you would only get 85% of the value. And now as we've dug into that further, we don't see we don't see that being true. So we have not updated it yet to show the full value of the tax credit. Um, so that'll bring it down some when we put in the full value of the tax credit. Um, but again, we're right now we're we're also expecting that at some point there'll be additional opportunities to bring that down for with uh, further support. And, and I guess the question that I would have is do those tax credits have a time limit? I mean, are they is there a certain amount of certain bucket that it is drawing from, you know, it's six, $6 billion and when that's gone, it's gone, or is it, uh, is it an ongoing type of a, a funding mechanism? Well, I mean, you know, the interesting, again, I, I, I'm i probably going to get quickly outside of my pure expertise, but the interesting thing about a tax credit is it's a, you know, it doesn't really have to be appropriated, even though they're, they've got the direct pay option. It's it's really sort of something run more out of the Department of Treasury, say, than like the Department of Energy. So um, right now, the limitation in the Inflation Reduction Act for any of these tax credits is uh, 2032 or 75% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions as a country, uh, whichever is later. Uh, so, I mean, our current estimates right now are that we're not going to be anywhere near 75% reduction by 2032. So we expect that right now we don't really expect a time limit uh, or a uh, dollar limit uh, on either one of those. Thank you. Three other questions. I think it could be quick if other commissioners were willing to. Yeah. Uh, real quick. Uh, so. Do the small scale gener uh, actually generate more waste per uh, kilowatt hour than the other uh, typical power plants, nuclear power plants? It's it's really comparable. Uh, the only the only one that 
you know, is the X energy technology or the ones that use that triso fuel um, because of the significant amount of graphite and, and, uh, and carbon in in making up all the, the shells, if you will, um, that does increase the volume, not of the actual high level waste, but just the volume of what it takes to store it because of all that graphite. But but on the flip side, it's also far more resilient. So, you know, there's there's really no way that earthquakes or water in leakage or anything could ever cause those those pebbles to break open and, and release anything. So it's a much more robust form for long term storage, um, but the volume is is higher because of it's but it's more it's more graphite volume, if you will, than it is uh, used, you know, a nuclear high level nuclear waste volume. Um, you said that it's meltdown proof. I was getting nervous when somebody said that it's it's proof. It's like saying the Titanic is unsinkable. But what what about this design makes it less dangerous than than the others? Is it because of this kind of graphite piece in there, or is it something else? Uh, the fuel is the main thing. Now all of these all of these reactor designs have you know are set up now that they have passive safety fix systems. So like what you saw in Fukushima was when you lost the ability to drive water into the core uh, because you lost power to pumps and motors. In these designs, they don't require any offsite. They don't require any onsite or offsite electricity to shut down safely. They don't have any pumps or motors required uh, to shut down safely. Uh, the X energy design, it's the fuel, but it's also designed such that if you lost all your helium, for example, the 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 heating that occurs there causes their nuclear reactions to just shut down. Um, and so it's just designed in that 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 uh, they shut themselves down. Um, that's really the the way it works in the US. Uh, the Chernobyl design um, is not possible in the US. Um, the Chernobyl design had what's called a positive reactivity coefficient. Um, none of that's not that's not legal in the US. So uh, these reactors cannot run away when they when they start to heat up, they self limit and shut down the power. And so X Energy's fuel, uh, the DOE has declared this the most robust fuel on Earth and tends to use it for space travel as well as as other applications because of how robust it is and their belief that it's meltdown proof. Um, what what we've been told is that you know again well this this fuel has been lab national lab tested and analyzed forever it's been around for a long time this isn't a new idea um, so there's a lot of analysis out there around this fuel and what we've been told is you could throw this in a volcano and it can't melt so uh, it can't melt in any temperature that these reactors could create um, and so you know yes I agree with you it's not meltdown proof under you know any conditions but any conditions these reactors could create. And even, like I said, throwing them in a, in a volcano of lava. So. Thanks. And then finally, your organizations, they've studied you know, all kinds of different technology. I'm just curious um, about green hydrogen and what your thoughts are on that. If that's something that you've looked at. We have looked at that. Um, I will tell you what we've concluded is, is that um, right now we don't see a viable way for hydrogen to be a an energy storage or energy generation uh, resource at least not cost competitive i believe hydrogen is a very viable option for uh, a transportation fuel and particularly when you're talking about uh, medium and long haul or heavy haul equipment you know that where you know basically by the time you put enough batteries in an 18 wheeler you don't have much room left to you know for it to be able to go anywhere in distance you don't have um any uh, much room for for any hauling and, and of course I don't have to tell a utility the challenges of of you know trying to charge an 18 wheeler at any appreciable time in order to get back on the road and what that does from a power spiking standpoint so I, I think I think batteries from a from a heavy medium and heavy haul trucking kind of aspect are a real challenge I think that's where hydrogen fuel cells are probably the better option and I think hydrogen is a great uh, viable uh, transportation fuel source for that. And I think that's where we should be focusing. The challenges with hydrogen are you can't put it in the existing natural gas system more than about 20% or it starts to embrittle the pipes. It's a uh, high leakage because it's a very small molecule. So and you're, you're talking about having to create uh, invest in resources that 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 make the hydrogen and then you have to invest in significant resources to store it and then you have to convert your natural gas plants or create other 
uh, resources near where you're making it to to convert it back into electricity. So it's just a significant capital investment uh, to make that all work. But we have been involved. Uh, we are involved in the Northwest uh, Hydrogen Hub application process. We are looking at what opportunities there are out there for that. Like I said, our personal our our analysis has said that it's better as a transportation fuel than an energy storage or generation resource. Thank you very much. Really appreciate the information you shared with us. Wrap it up, Mr. Okay. Well, thank you again for your time. Appreciate you taking. You're time. welcome. Okay. So we're at 7:50, and you know, that was quite a bit over. This is our break. We will take the break, and then we'll go to the IRP after the break. So we will come back at eight o'clock.
All right, we're going to go to the 2023 IRP Results Publication and Action Plan. Well, before I kick us off, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Booth, the Chief Energy Resource Officer here at eWeb. Uh, joining me up here, we have Lane Tapper uh, and Jared. Sure. In this department, we'll go ahead and jump to it. So uh, I will uh, help everybody out by moving a lot of the agenda, but then add a little bit of color commentary. Uh, we're going to look at the strategic importance of the IRP, uh, the time this process, uh, click link that I've already been. 23 IRP report, our action plan, which is the end of the night here. And also, uh, we're hoping for some lively discussion, although I'm, I'm sorry to see that a bunch of our lively discussion left at this time. Uh, so what you'll notice is not in the agenda. Original bond is a full review of the IRP report. Uh, the full report is already made available to the commission. This is strictly supplemental. We're hoping for yeah, next steps. And with next steps. Right. Uh, the strategic importance of the IRP. Um, by 2028, we expect to be reassembling our power portfolio. We entered a new BPA contract. We'll be participating in the Western Resource Adequacy Program. We expect to be in a semi automated uh, pricing market. And we're also looking at the expiration of multiple power purchase agreements. We currently supply our power here at 2015. Well, that is a lot. Uh, the IRP is a tool that we use to forecast our needs and find the least cost options to fill those needs. It is strictly a financial model. What's the, the best use of rate payer dollars to go out and do this? It is also an iterative process. We will be renewing this every two years, and we fully intend to get better at it. Uh, this is a muscle that you would have not used for 10 years prior to this round. It is one that's going to get stronger over time. Let's see, I did want to mention that uh, in addition to being that financial model, we also have to live within the constraints of policy that are set by the board. So we intend to reduce our carbon footprint or carbon intensity, roughly half, uh, dropping, excuse me, increasing our carbon free content uh, to 95% by 2030. I want to add also that this is, a, this is an industry standard approach. Uh, where I came from, it's Orange Beauty. We've been doing these iterative processes for many, many years. We're doing it the right way. I, I've seen nothing but good things out of this team. Lastly, I want to say that the IRP is informed of strategy. It is not a rigid handbook on how to go out and do this. It is more like a compass. We want to go north, the compass points north. But between now and then, we have all kinds of terrain that we need to navigate. And that's how we're going to look at this as we get into our action plans. Take it on these two to three year action plans, plans that we can manage as that train you know, enters our department. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I am really fortunate to have the opportunity to talk about um, where we've been and how we've uh, gotten to where we are today. You can see here uh, the IRP timeline. This shows from December 2022 when we first published our public draft of the IRP. Uh, there are a few things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is that you have all uh, seen the briefings uh, that were published in response to board and stakeholder feedback, and most of these were sent to you in the um, uh, to the board in June, and you'll also find them in your board packet and on the internet. Uh, the goal of the briefings was to explore areas of community interest by doing a deeper dive into uh, areas of uh, zero carbon resource, zero low carbon resources, solar utility scale batteries, um, diversity, equity and inclusion, as well as resource acquisition, um, the new resource acquisition process. Secondly, uh, staff have added a risk analysis to the sensitivity analysis to show how poor water conditions and high gas prices could impact our future portfolios. Finally, uh, staff and management worked to prepare a recommended action plan that Brian's already mentioned that identified key areas of focus for the next two to three years. 
and that is where we're going to spend most of our time uh, today. However, before passing this on to Ben, um, this is the end of an 18 month process. And so um, I know tomorrow we will start our 2025 IRP, but before doing that, I just want to take a moment and really, you know, first of all, acknowledge the board. Um, you've been engaged, you've asked questions, you've sat down with us um, on your own time and, you know, provided us with direction and really um, helped us land on what I consider a great foundation from which we can continue to build. And I uh, also want to recognize the customers and their engagement. Uh, wow, we've had some great showings for our briefings and you've taken uh, time, uh, value, your valuable time to provide us with feedback. Um, I also want to acknowledge our core IRP team, which is Ben Ulrich at the lead. And then we have um, in the back of the room, we have John Kreider, who is our modeler and Aaron Bush, Aaron go. Aaron Bush, who uh, is really our researcher and our drafter, and then Aaron Olaski back there from the communications uh, team that ran a really impressive stakeholder process uh, and helped us make our work accessible and understandable to um, to really the majority of people. So finally, this was a cross-functional um, effort. It took people from all over the organization, um, from uh, customer solutions and IT. I mean, we, we really needed IT support and um, uh, finance as well, as well as the broader public planning uh, team. So I just think it's important that we say uh, thank you to everyone for, for getting us where we are today. And um, now I'm gonna pass it off to Ben to uh, walk us through our recommended actions to help us go from our 2023 IRP learnings to our 2025 IRP. Great, okay, thanks Megan. That's work, okay. So before we dive into the recommended action plan, I wanted to go through a list of some of the key insights from this IRP. Uh, so one of the first things uh, that we want to highlight is that when we forecasted our demand for electricity in the future, we're anticipating that electrification is going to be a driver of our growth in the future as we anticipate that our customers start to adopt electric vehicles. We also found that uh, our winter peaks are expected to be our highest periods of demand, even as our summer peaks continue to rise. And based on those needs, our modeling results showed that UF could need new resources as soon as 2026. Uh, using our analytical tools, we looked at some potential portfolios and the ideal mix of resources that could be used to meet those needs in the future. And under We did that under a reference case scenario, as well as three different sensitivity portfolios. We also did some risk analysis to show how poor hydro conditions and high gas prices would impact those portfolios and we included that risk analysis in this final IRP document. We found that large hydropower from BPA can provide low cost, low carbon uh, energy and could be foundational to our least cost portfolio in the future. We also found uh, that our risk analysis showed us that this concentration in hydro can create financial uncertainty caused by the water conditions which change annually. However, over time, as eWeb diversifies our mix uh, and supplement that hydro portfolio, we can see the impacts of those poor water conditions be less impactful to the total portfolio. eWeb looks to supplement our, our hydro portfolio. We found that wind and batteries are promising options. We also found that customer partnerships will be vital and that uh, customer facing programs like conservation and demand response can play a role in our portfolio portfolio as well. And lastly, we found that low or zero carbon dispatchable resources like geothermal or small modular nuclear or some resource that's still yet to be developed will be needed as part of that least cost fully decarbonized strategy. So with those key insights in mind, we want to step through the recommended action plan. The full text of the recommended action plan can be found in Appendix A of the IRP document. This is what we'll be seeking board approval of at the August board meeting. Management staff sat down to develop a recommended action plan um, that considered our strategic plan, organization of organizational values, and uh, board policies. We started much with a much larger list, but managed to narrow it down into eight areas of focus where we can take action in the next two to three years. And those actions, which are listed on the right-hand side of the slide here, are what we're gonna cover in more detail tonight. 
So the first area of focus is the BPA contract. The most impactful resource decision that you will for 2028 is the BPA contract. Today, EGOP gets about 80% of our power from BPA, and the existing contract is expected to is going to expire in September of 2028. We are actively engaged in the post-2028 contract negotiations so that we can understand how much energy and capacity we could get from BPA in the future. We want to influence the development of potential products from BPA through active participation in the regional negotiation process. In addition, we want to analyze those new products to understand how it could change our future portfolio. Therefore, staff is recommending that you have continue to actively engage in the 2028 contract negotiation process, and then we analyze those new product infra, uh, new products options from BPA as soon as information becomes available. <laughs> Next area of focus is conservation and energy efficiency. Conservation is often a least cost local resource option, and EWEB is already familiar with the program. Cost effective energy efficiency was selected in our IRP modeling, but we aren't certain on exactly how much conservation exists in our community today or how much it would cost to implement those programs. Purchased conservation can play a role in our in our portfolio. But we need to have a better sense of the program administration costs uh, and the financial incentives that would be required to achieve those savings. For this reason, staff is recommending a study to look at the cost and potential for conservation in our service territory. The results of this conservation potential assessment could be used as an input to our future IRP. The next area of focus is demand response. Demand response is shifting or shedding of electricity demand in response to the needs of the grid. Technology advances for both eWeb and our customers are creating more opportunities for cost effective demand response programs. Some portion of electricity use is discretionary and there are opportunities to partner with our customers to shift their demands to other parts of the day. In our IRP modeling, we found that off peak electric vehicle charging and shifting our customer demand away from our existing system peaks presenting a meaningful savings opportunity for the portfolio. We also, um, so because of this, staff is re recommending that we look at a study to look at the value, cost, and potential for demand response in our service territory. It can be used as a future input to our IRPs and help us understand how DR programs could be used to create value for all eWeb customers. We also recommend that eWeb develop a product plan to understand what DR programs we should roll out to our customers first. The next area of focus is around existing resource contracts. We know that several of our local resource contracts are set to expire in the next five years, and that will create new resource needs. EWEB already has relationships with Sierra Pacific International Paper and the University of Oregon, and we recommend engaging with our local resource owner operators to understand their future plans and identify areas where EWEB and the local generators may have mutual interests. Next area of focus is around future resource contracts. Our IRP analysis showed that it's likely EWEB will need to buy new resources in the future. Therefore, staff are recommending that we develop a resource acquisition strategy and a decision framework that can guide our future investment decisions. This decision framework can be an expanded triple bottom line approach and will consider our strategic priorities, board policies, and our values. This new strategy and decision framework could be used to translate our IRP strategy into a procurement strategy. The next area of focus is the market and a market impact analysis. There are two impactful Western market initiatives that will influence eWeb's future resource decisions. The first is the Western Resource Adequacy Program, more commonly called the RAP, which is focused on reliability. This program will likely impose a planning reserve margin onto eWeb, meaning eWeb and other utilities will be required to carry reserve capacity in the future to ensure grid reliability. The second market initiative is the formation of a day ahead organized market in the Northwest. This would be a significant change in the way energy is traded. It would mean shifting from a system of bilateral trades today to one where market prices are formed through bidding into a centralized market. Formation of a day ahead market will be very impactful for energy trading in the Northwest and could come as soon as 2026. 
staff is recommending that you have track and identify the opportunities and impacts that these market initiatives could have on our wholesale operations. We also need to consider the impacts that these could that these markets could have to eWeb's business model. To prepare, eWeb will need to identify the investments required in people and processes in order to participate in these new market constructs. And this analysis can help us get there. The next area of focus is ongoing IRP refinements. As an industry, electric utilities are constantly changing our assumptions and adapting to new conditions. We've done a lot of work to establish and establish an initial set of tools and assumptions for this IRP. And like all other utilities, we've learned a lot along the way. We see opportunities to use continuous improvement to enhance our input assumptions and our modeling approach. As a result, staff is recommending that we take the time to update our modeling assumptions to incorporate supply chain cost increases, new tax incentives, and information from developers like what we just heard from Energy Northwest. Uh, we also see the need to improve and expand our new resource options in the model, for example, including things like geothermal. Uh, and lastly, uh, the, the next area of focus is preparation for the next IRP. Uh, Brian teased me, he says, this, is this fun, the fun thing about IRPs is that you kick off the next one as soon as you finish this one? And, and he, that was a good question because I said, oh, it's kind of fun. Uh, but but it really it's it's really kicking off a brand new work stream where you get to build on what we've done so far. And so our next IRP is going to align with the BPA contract decision, and we hope it will include more information about our demand response and conservation. And so staff is looking that uh, is recommending that uh, we look at those key inputs now and get started on that right away. We want to have a specific focus on incorporating those new potential BPA products. And we want to ensure that the conservation potential assessment and the demand response study are completed in a timely fashion in order to be used as an input into our next IRP. So in addition to the eight areas of focus, we're recommending uh, the recommended action plan includes some recommended strategy updates for the next few years. The first strategy update is for conservation. We recommend adjusting from our previous strategy of meeting all load growth with conservation to meeting most of our load growth with conservation. This will allow us to keep our existing conservation targets stable and sustainable while we take the time to do a deeper dive with con the conservation potential assessment. For our resource acquisition strategy, we recommend meeting our near-term resource gaps with market purchases under our existing risk management policies. This will allow us to meet our near-term ne near needs while working to develop a more formal resource acquisition strategy to help us make long-term resource decisions. We also recommend continuing our stakeholder, stakeholder engagement strategy, focusing on building trust and confidence with our customers while educating and soliciting feedback. And, and we also want to work to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion principles into our IRP work. We know that other utilities are doing similar work and we want to adapt our processes as we learn more about DEI. So with that, we can open up for uh, board discussion and feedback on the recommended action plan. Staff plan to bring uh, the recommended action plan back for board approval at the August board meeting. And uh, no break. <laughs> and we can open up for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Can I have questions? Three minutes. Um, I have um, a couple of questions for you. So one is about the BPA contract. There seems to be like a lot of mystery around it because we don't know what they're going to offer, what they're going to do. Um, and when will we have more information on that? <laughs> um, Bonneville is coming out with a draft policy rod, record of decision. Uh, at the end of this month. And what that will do is it will, it will give us some indication of the policy that, um, that, that they're looking at. And then we'll have an ability to influence that as a, you know, as a region, as we work with all the other utilities. And then in the, I think it's December, January, they'll be putting out a final draft policy. And then after that, we move into um, talking about products. 
we translate the policy into products. So in early 2024, we'll be looking at um, products, products and contract language, and that will take us down into about the end of 2025, and then people will start redoing their analysis in the beginning of 25 and sign by October of 2025. That is the plan. Um, my other question is about the resource acquisition strategy. So there's a lot of exciting new developments that are happening right in the energy sector with the IRA. There's all this money, but um, how do we plan for it when there's a lot of possibilities out there, but there's nothing that's really like online yet. And even if the technology is possible, there's so much with like, um, permitting and licensing and that kind of stuff gets in the way. So how do we actually plan for that? Some thoughts on that, but I know, Brian, if you had any thoughts on the strategy side of it. Uh, my initial thought is, I think you're highlighting the exact gap that we see right now too. We shared our modeling results with everyone and said, this is just a, just a forecast of potential options. And so the first thing we want to do is refine our assumptions now. So we want to talk to developers. We want to see incorporate supply chain, but we're seeing this resource acquisition strategy and procurement strategy as being something we need to sit down and think about more and communicate with the board about. And I think that's why we're recommending it as an action plan to better articulate how we're going to translate modeling results into an actual acquisition strategy. So I don't have a concrete answer yet, but I think we're seeing that need and that's why we're recommending it as an action. Right, but I do want to just follow up in that we have been here before. We've been, you know, we, we, we have staff that have gone through this and that that we we look and we 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 talk to you. We look at our values and we say, what do we want to do more research on? And then we do actually that we we could do an RFI or a request for information. We could do an RFP, and then we look at what we get. I mean, this is this is there are some standards, um, I guess, processes ar around that. Um, and so it's it's not like we're coming in cold. But what I think this this um, uh, this strategy will help us do is all be on the same page with where we are and how how we how we all see this occurring. And just one really quick comment is that um, what we're doing tonight is we're not we're not voting to approve or recommend specific resources. We are just looking at this strat this these actions to explore what our possibilities are. So I just want to be clear about that because um, I don't want people to think that because we had a presentation tonight on nuclear, what we're doing is we're voting to say, yes, we're going to go nuclear, or we heard something on green hydrogen, but we're just exploring what our options are. That's really what, yeah, that's really what, as, as Brian said earlier, that's really what an IRP is. It's it's giving you us that, that compass of where we have all these things that are happening. Where are our priorities? Where do we need to start looking into the future? And that's um, that, that's exactly what exactly what we're doing. And, you know, we are lucky because we keep saying we have time. I know 26 sounds, you know, a long, but, but we do have, we, we are in, we're going in the right direction. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. And uh, what do you think of recommendation actions? I like them. Thank you. Um, but clarify on you said water volatility uh, will have an impact on Bonneville. So this year they're at seventy percent. They're hurt. So how's that affecting us financially or supply wise? If I mean, if if a thirty percent deviation from the norm doesn't affect us, then why is it a concern? But if it does affect it, how has it affected us this year? It does affect us, and you'll see it in the budget monitoring results that we're getting this year that it, it does hurt our portfolio. And so we did the risk analysis, and it showed that today we can see a 10% cost change in our portfolio just because of water conditions alone. And so it does impact, impact us today. And in the risk analysis, we kind of found that um, as our portfolio, we start adding more resources that are not hydro, it diminishes diminishes our concentration. It's like stocks and bonds, you're diversifying your portfolio. So in a way, as we add other resources other than hydro, it makes the impact of that water condition less impactful to the total for that. That makes sense. And then the next day, that thing went right over my head a little bit, that, that, the next day pricing or whatever that was. So um, 
at one time we used to do the trading for other utilities because of our trade. Are we still doing that? And schedule. We, we, we do, yes, we schedule for other utilities. We schedule for others, okay, trading, whatever it's called. But we, we may make money off of that. Is that the same concept you're talking about here is doing that? I mean, you know, explain that to me because I can't follow it. So let me let me give the 30 second overview on, on what this means. Yeah. Uh, scheduling would still exist. Um, what would change in the automated market would be the pricing. So instead of the traders picking up the phone and negotiating the price over the phone, we would all bid in our resources into a centralized market okay. and then decide the price. Okay. And if your bid is below the clearing price, they say you eWeb turn on your resources. If it's above the clearing price, we don't. Okay. So our Physical operations still look very much the same. It's the pricing. It's, it's just the way you could operate with it. But okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I, would, I would just so if, if you own stocks today, you don't start calling up people saying, do you want to buy my stock? Sure. You go on E-Trade and you put conditions in there and the market operator, which is E-Trade, manages that for you. It's, it's a similar sort of rough analogy moving from a bilateral market to an organized market. There's a market operator that manages when you may or may not turn on resources or may or may not sell resources depending on the price. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Whitworth, I like the idea that we are moving right from one IRP into the next. So I, I have a couple of questions. The first is, if we were to drop small modular or nuclear from the, the model here, then it's supposed to head in 2042 in this iteration, in this two-year window. How much of an effect did that have on, on it? Yeah, I'm I can't speak to that off the top of my head, I guess, uh, but I, it would not be very material on the reference case because it was only 10 megawatts, so really small, so like 1% of your portfolio. It would have a small, small impact under the reference. But, under the reference but, but community wide, it would have a large impact, right? Just from what we saw here today. And and I think maybe we, you know, we could look at it in the next iteration. Just yeah. what, what it did show was when we looked at sensitivities, the more we turn up growth, the more nuclear was pulled in and the more and the nearer term it was pulled in. So there was a sensitivity there that the more growth we are forecasting, the more nuclear becomes applicable. Um, now that's when we look at the two year action plan, uh, there is nothing up there that right. says we're going to go build a nuclear plant. Uh, so it has really it. And I would actually, you know, since it, this meeting also we're having the long term financial plan discussion An IRP is basically a long term financial plan. What the board actually ends up doing is approving the next year's budget. And in this case, you're approving the action plan. I understand that. And I'm just looking at politically. Um, yeah. And, and the. the perception that we have. We put out a we put out a thing and we got 30 people showing up thinking that we're building a nuclear plant on our on Rose on our space in Roosevelt. And I'm just sensitive to that and looking for ways that we can alleviate that. So go ahead. Yeah. So I would reiterate that this is it is strictly a financial model. And in our next iteration of it, we hope to be able to other iterations. So we could give you a, a with and without nuclear. Great. That would give you a, a dollar number. Uh, well, nuclear out, it means some number of additional dollars we'd have to spend on a replacement resource. And that's a decision that we would come to the board. It's some minimum amount. I, I would imagine that we'd all prefer not to. But if we come back and say it'll cost a billion dollars to not build nukes, then we need to have a serious conversation about it. Um, the next question I have is, other utilities are doing IRPs as well. Um, House Bill 2021 said that investors in all utilities need to be 100% carbon free by a time specific. 
how are they, what are they doing in their IRPs to reach that last 5%? And is that something that we can look at in future IRPs going forward? Because if we can, if other utilities in the state are doing it, by mandate, they have to do it. It would be interesting to know in the next iteration what that is costing them. And are we in a uh, position to be able to do some of the same things? That's a really good, I think that's a really good point. I think I also want to point out what Brian said earlier is that the, the, the approach we're taking is very standard and it's very standard to what? Uh, sure, I, go finish, finish your. <laughs> Sorry, I heard that. Was, I thought it was standard. Um, so the the approach is is pretty standard. It's real, very standard. And and so just as you heard Greg Cullen talk about how Pacific Corps um, has is investing in in the SMRs, they do they are including you know SMRs and all of the available technology in the next ten years. That's pretty standard um, in their IRPs. And then they get their results. And then they have you know they have the PUC, but then they have boards that look at it and say, okay, now now what are we going to do with that information? Um, and, and so, but, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I was just going to add on, I mean, it is not, there is not currently an identified solution in all So Pete, Portland General Electric, their IRP specifically says we can meet the 2030 goals, which are, I think, right, 80%, right? So it's, they're moving from not particularly low carbon to lower carbon by 2030. They can meet that with existing technologies. And then their IRP says, we do not yet have the technology identified to meet the 2040 goal. Um, we have put in SMR as kind of a proxy. It's a potentially viable technology, right? There's a lot of uncertainty around all these things. Um, people are making bets on different things. Portland General said, for this iteration, we don't have the answer yet. They want to get it again. And, and, and that's what I was just hoping from is that, you know, the people who have the sharp stick pointed at their back, we, we might be able to learn from them. Uh, I was going to say, Commissioner Borofsky, in September, uh, the executive director of the Pacific Northwest Utility Conference is going to present to this group the Northwest Regional Forecast. And that is the accumulation of all of the IRPs in the region. So there'll be a few things like the mystery resource that was identified. There's also, they have to do carbon reduction plans along with their IRPs. And there are some cost off ramps for that as well. So it's a little bit of a different environment. Thank you. But that'll be September. Yeah, thanks. Um, thank you, as always, for the, the presentation um, and the, the packet you provided is super helpful. Um, I have a question about the sensitivity analyses that we did. Um, the high electrification scenario, which you know, certainly I'm, I don't think is a good move. Um, there were a couple of stressors that came with that that I have questions about. So one is that, as I read it, and tell me if I have this right, that the, the most of the increase of peak in that scenario or in that sensitivity comes from unmanaged charging. Is that right? Yes, and that's true of the reference case as well. Do we do we think that will happen? That we'll have a scenario where there's unmanaged key charging? Don't we have a huge influence on whether or not key charging is managed or unmanaged? Yeah, when, when Brian first started at, at EWEB, he, he kind of referred to it as a problem statement. So when we think about our peaks, if we do nothing to intervene, what, what would our portfolio look like? And that's why we did the managed EV charging scenario as well to show yeah. how that one assumption is very meaningful. Right. Um, but you're right. I, I think EWIP does plan to influence our customers' behavior. Yeah, right. Yeah, so as I think about the that combined with the, like the low transmission scenario, those combined bring the the need for the mystery generation, in, in this case, the SMR that we're, we end up talking about, brings that kind of forward in time, as you said, right? Um, and I just think it feels like that we have a lot of influence over at least that piece. And then the other piece of the high electrification scenario is um, is 50%, right, of residential units that are heated with natural gas get electrified. Uh, and I don't, I haven't done all the math exactly, but I think it's about, there's like 20,000 units, residential units, right? Yeah, right. Um, right. So we're looking at 10,000 residential units that would have to be electrified over the next 17 years, which is 
600 units a year, and we're currently doing ish. Like it's I, I, that would be amazing. I hope we can do that. And also, it's hard for me to. It, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe the IRP incentives get us there. You all know better than than we do. But that's a huge bump, right? Something dangerous to look into my crystal ball. Yeah. You have one? What do you mean? Uh, I'm an economist. <laughs> <laughs> um, the IRA incentives have made well, significantly cheaper than central air conditioning. And yeah. To the extent that people central air conditioning and it occasionally needs to be replaced is considerably less expensive after incentives to install it. Which now means that they'll have a, a dual where their heat pump will get something like 80% of their heat drain away. That is a considerable amount of electricity for us. Is the systems typically switch over to gas when it gets below 30, 35 degrees, right. and the peaking gets pushed up to Northwest Natural. Right. Same, right. Uh, I could definitely see the 600 a year. Okay. Just imagining the rate at which air conditioners fail. That's super helpful. Thank you. All right. Well, optimism on that. Uh, two other questions, and, and then I'll end here. Um, We've talked a little bit last month about um, just the local, locally controlled power, um, like what ELIP has control over, especially if there's like a regional power outage, you know, what are we able to manage ourselves? Um, and I'm curious, do we know what the percentage of locally controlled assets or generation currently looks like? Top of my head is what percentage is local? Yeah, and maybe it's on an average. I don't know. And I would just put forward that as we're thinking about the future energy supply resources, that number five there, um, that maybe that's something we think about is, you know, what's our current amount of local generation? And, and I would propose that we try and keep it there over time, at least not back step on what we have controlled locally. Another interesting comparison would be what um, what kind of generation is required to meet just fundamental needs? So running hospitals and fire stations, police stations and e-web facilities and, and and water, you know, a skeletal water system. Like if we could have that in mind as we're thinking about how much local generation do we want, I think this would be valuable to bake into number five. And then lastly, I think this action plan is is spot on in terms of all the things we need to do. So thanks for queuing it up. Thank Just clarification, uh, Commissioner McRae. I think that also applies to number four up there, which is the existing contract. Sure. So both yeah. four and five. Yeah. Uh, there's a resiliency component to that, and I think that's kind of what we've been talking about, yeah. incorporating that policy into this process. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Thank you. Anything? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um. I agree with the recommended actions. I know that we're just providing direction. We'll come back and vote on it next month. Um, but is it possible to provide a scenario, plug it in, pops out really quick, where nuclear is not on the table, just for informational purposes? And if we get that, does it influence any of these decisions on here, or is that it's so far in the future that it really doesn't impact the direction of any of these? I would certainly, you know, by looking at what, what action items we have and all that we need to do, I would certainly recommend that we start getting to work on the future and then we have a conversation around the 2025 IRP. So the decision that we're making, it doesn't touch that. And then what we do, so there's time to, to touch that later. But I, I do also, Appreciate what John Borowski was saying because I know that we got a lot of feedback today because we would put out a hey we're we're going to have nuclear in our portfolio as a news item which none of us knew about until it was already in the media and I know that that definitely ruffled many feathers so it just I would maybe like to put out a show of like hey we're actually not doing this more publicly, yes, it's a consideration down the road, but that's not, we're making a decision on this tonight. 
we had 16 people that came and gave us a, a lot of feedback and we don't get a lot of people that come down even for very big decisions. So I, I want to also kind of clarify is that the, the model is it, it doesn't say we're considering it. It's 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 we're, we're running a model, you know, that, that's based on but that's it. not what the people see. I mean, if you are a lay person in the community, this is a an option. This is a portfolio that they think that we are voting. on. It's not you can tell me that all day long, but that's not what the public sees. So we have a public perception challenge that is very different than what the process is here. So to whatever extent we can disconnect those two and make that message a lot clearer for the public, I would appreciate that. That's that might be good. We'll take on some of that, Commissioner Carlson. Um, I also think people read too much into it. I, I read the releases. I approved the releases. And they didn't say anything that, about us going out and buying nuclear. What they said was we need to consider this kind of resource. And here's a couple of examples of those kinds of resources. And so there is nothing in here that says. Fine line. <laughs> it says that we have to consider these things. And I believe we should keep it in the modeling. We should keep natural gas in the modeling. Because how else are we going to know what the best choices are, whether it picks that or not? And so we have people saying, take it out of the modeling. Don't consider it. It's an evil word. And that's wrong. Um, we are taking so many resources off the table. What's left on the table? Because this is this is going to uh, this is headed a bad direction from a regional uh, from an industry perspective. If we start taking things off the table because people show up and don't like it. Um, and I'm not saying that it's anywhere in here that we're going to go build a nuclear station, but we need to keep it in our consideration. That's all. Okay, I'm and I'm fine with saying these are the costs. I mean, from an economics background, here are the costs and benefits of each of these things. But that's how I feel like we need to approach it. Hey, we throw everything in the mix so that we can look at the costs and benefits of each of these things and we can be clear with the community about, okay, we looked at all of these different options and we decided, hey, maybe these are not the best option because the costs are really terrible or it's going to cost $3 billion to do this or whatever that is. Um, but that needs to be very clear that our methodology is we include everything from a neutral perspective, but not we are going out and we're doing this. Because when you put out a singular press release in the media that says we're considering nu nuclear, <laughs> that that to me sends a totally different message. But I'll leave it from there. Anyway. Okay. Kind of counter that a little bit. When I saw that information in the presentation this evening, the, the current administration's Department of Energy is spending $2.5 billion just so people can research it, tell gives me a message too, yeah. that the current the current administration, the House, the Senate, everybody else, Department of Energy is wants to look at it, and I don't see anything different from that than what, what we're doing. There's no way in hell you're going to pass a, a nuclear uh, thing, and, and especially in this town, let alone the state, it's against the law. Right. And well, it's not going to change the law, but I, I agree with Frank that it's it's important that we consider it in there, just like we consider gas, and you know, and, and I've been through the Seneca thing and, uh, and how bad that was perceived and turned out to be, in my opinion, not, not as bad as everybody thought. So I keep it on the table, keep it considered, but then at the end, it's it's our decision. And we listen to the people who put us here and so be it. But I, I, I agree we probably should have it in the model along with everything else just to see how, you know, because there's not just the economics of it, there's the social, you know, it's like the triple bottom line. We've got all a lot more than just money and, and resource adequacy. And, and he's right, you know, if 40% if of our electricity in Oregon is generated by gas and coal, what are we going to do? Because gas is no longer legal and coal is going away. And that's a big chunk. So. I'm going to be the dead horse. All right. Anything else? No. All right. Do you have what you need? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Now I'm going to bring up the next item. But Dr. Rob, we could potentially move this to the next month. Uh, uh, wild, uh, wildfire mitigation plan. Are there any objections to moving that to the next month? Yeah, I have I, I have a problem with that. I mean, we just had an urban urban wildfire 
as we it's been in the news. It's an important, it's an important topic to talk about. We've had a staff person sitting in the back of the room for five hours now. Don't you worry about little old me. <laughs> That's just my feeling. I mean, I was, I was, uh, I, I saw that, I saw that hail burning last Friday, and it was disheartening. Well, it's not, you know, I've had meetings till eleven. Just as long as we don't get past eleven, I'm good. <laughs> Yes, for the person who's giving me, you know what, liquor. <laughs> yeah. right. And you know, you're I tried to provide options. This is what I get for it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, then we'll continue on. That's what I'm hearing. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. I'll through ten slides very quickly and just give you as much time as possible. Okay. And I think Tyler next is going to join me. So. For the record, I'm Janine Perkins, OC Program Manager. Thanks for having me on a late night. So we're here to discuss and potentially approve a wildfire mitigation plan for the calendar year 23 to 2024. Um, if you are like me, when we talked about this last July, that feels like a decade ago. So I'm just going to like super high level, just recap. Um, you did your initial plan, and the goals for that initial plan were let's meet the PUC compliance, which was still forthcoming. We didn't even know what the rules were when you approved the plan, and adopt best practices were practical. So our focus areas were identify which parts of our service area are at highest risk for wildfire, focus on preventative maintenance, including like veg management, safety patrols in those areas, improve our situational awareness. We put that weather station in at Hayden Bridge. We have a new alert wildfire camera and really engage our partners in helping us develop this plan. And I really want to put a shout out to our communications team because they did a fantastic job last year with a portfolio of great news media coverage to bring awareness. And we needed that because in September we called our PSPS event. And if we hadn't already had that, like people paying attention, I don't think we would have been as successful in alerting those customers that they were going to be without power for 36 hours. So they really did pay off and I thank them a lot for that. Um, part of your adopting that plan was including plan metrics and as well as this annual cadence. So you can see all the metrics in the back of the plan, but you know, last year we were able to run through a number of different projects, everything from fields mitigation work to what I think is our biggest project was removal of about 31 miles of transmission line. And why that's important is we also were able to use that project to reconfigure the distribution underbuild Removed some seven dozen or so power um, uh, cross arms, which basically uh, removes a point of failure from our system for better reliability, but also increases clearance around the trees. So that's a great kind of two for one project that we were able to accomplish last year. Good news here is that if you look at this list, you can see that we are doing the work, we're meeting your targets, and I think exceeding them. Um, the not so great news, you just alluded to this, Commissioner Brosky, is when we talk about the 2023 wildfire season, you know, we went into it pretty good this spring. We had lots of rain, lots of snow, uh, drought conditions were favorable, looking better in Oregon, and then um, with still some drought conditions, but then we moved into May where it got very hot, and uh, they forecast an El Nino pattern for the rest of this year, starting in August, and what that means not a meteorologist, but it means hotter, drier, especially for the northern half of Oregon. And we saw that come to fruition because in, on July 4th, 5th, we had our first wildfire right in our backyard, um, 35 acres, uh, cost still undetermined, and preceding that, a red flag warning on July 3rd. So these always happen on the weekends when everybody's trying to go out on vacation. Um, Tyler and I were in close communication, so that was fun. Um, so um, as we think about this next year's plan, we're really focusing on operational readiness, but also honing in on some of our um, some of our research and development. So a couple of things we're doing this year that are new, just to bring to your attention, we'll do our first PSPS tabletop exercise, and that's really to test our decision making criteria, test some tools in the field, um, and work on the notification process because we really want to keep communication is like the most important part of PSPS. So we want to keep practicing that. We're procuring local uh, 
weather forecasting for fire weather. So that will start on Friday. We'll start getting daily forecasts um, using our local weather station, but some other weather stations. And that will help us make those really hard decisions if we need to call a PSPS. Um, should we do it? When do we do it? And when do we get people's power back on? So just gathering better information and data. And we've also started tracking ignition events from um, for bird related outages and I'm sorry, data. Let me start over. We're, I'm trying to go fast here. So we're trying, we're tracking both ignition and bird related outage data. So these are new data points. And the purpose of that is to help us figure out where there could be parts of our system where we want to um, do future mitigation. I think I'm turning this over to you, Tyler. Thank you. So you're going to run through. So, Tyler Nice, the Electric Division Manager, thanks for the time on this important topic, as you noted, so and timely. So, for this year, our operational readiness that we do every year is kind of a layered approach. So, Janine mentioned some of them. Every year, we go out and we inspect our components of our system in these circuits. We take a look at clearances for vegetation and we make that number one priority to trim. So the, the component replacements that were identified, those are in progress and we're getting close to the end of that. The vegetation side of things did get done, I think it was a week before the last week of June. So we, we kind of beat that, that rise in fire level. So that's the goal every year. Next thing we do is we partner with the Oregon Department of Forestry. They came and they trained all our crews and the new protocols or anything changed, fire safety, and they go out and inspect all of our trucks and tooling and pump trailers, make sure we have the right flows because we need those in place to do work throughout the year and respond. So check, check. And then the, the third thing we look at is improvement on last year's operational protocols. One of them that we're noting that, that Janine uh, hinted on was our protective settings, our power line protective settings that, that we've enacted. And it's a benchmark thing around utilities. So last year, our original plan, if you remember, going into it was anytime we have a red flag, we're going to go out and make those settings more sensitive. When the red flag leaves, we're gonna put it back to quote unquote normal. What we learned pretty quickly is those red flags can come without warning basically really quick and they can be short lived. And it became pretty burdensome to be able to respond to that quickly uh, with the work needed. So what we migrated to was keeping it on for all the fire season. Another thing that we've seen other utilities do after we benchmarked. This iteration of the plan sticks with that. So learning more and getting uh, tuned in on the notifications tighter for ODF and National Weather Service. Those settings go into effect when it goes to level two or moderate, um, which happened July 1st, June 30th. And then they'll stay in until it goes back down to low, which you know you don't know, but it could be September, early October you know, time frame. Uh, if we're on the shoulder kind of times of that where it's where it's low, but there's still possibilities of fire danger and red flag, we will do the on and off there. That that decision came from, we reflected on the outages and the reliability impacts from that decision last year, which was, you know, more on the conservative side and it was really the minimus impact. So we kept that decision. Uh, so those are kind of three operational readiness points and we can go to the next. I just want to oh, yeah. So because when we're in sensitive settings, we'll probably see more frequent outages and it could take longer to restore. So we changed our outage points. So and if you go out and you look up an outage, you'll see where the high risk fire zones are. And that will help alert people that if you have an outage and you're in the orange section, you might experience a longer restoration time because we are going to go out and patrol those lines. Mm -hmm. So that was another piece of um, you know, public awareness. On the research and development, we're calling it another layered approach here. Um, you know, one piece that we're looking at is posted here. Said, well, this is your show and tell moment. I know it's my show and tell moment. So I got something to build up. I got to build up. I got to build up to it. Modeling and investment. So uh, one of the things we're doing, another tail on from last year, is continue on with our modeling of fire behavior, fire risk, and that's going to focus our investments on certain areas in these circuits. Second layer of that is relying more on boots on the ground experience. So we're we're uh, putting resources to doing lots of ride alongs, lots of anal analysis of outages with the crews that respond to it because they have some really specific pinpointed improvements we can do. The third one, which is the props, an example of new technology uh, is uh, 
ex non expulsion fuses. So this is a normal fuse and this one is a non expulsion fuse. You can see they're different sizes. They act differently electrically. Um, the non expulsion fuse is another benchmark thing that we're looking into. We actually signed a study this week with a consultant to study applicability of our system and, and impact reliability and it really in, in decreases the, the possibility of ignition. So that's something you can see it's different form factor take some construction standard changes. Some we're hoping to get to the bottom of this year and then uh, do a pilot on. So if you have any juice left in you at the end of the night, you want to mess with these and take them apart, see how they work. I can show you. Uh, but that's that's the three examples of research and development along with and out of those first two projects will be spawned is the idea. And then lastly, we just want to um, talk about the another new initiative is a PSPS port program. So when we learned last year and a lot of other utilities are looking at this, that there are a segment of customers who are especially vulnerable during an outage. So these are folks with have a medical need for power because they have equipment or they have mobility constraints. So we are doing a trying to create an opt in program where these folks can let us know that they have special needs. And if they sign up for the program, we will do personalized notifications in advance of a PSPS. Make sure they know that this is happening. Make sure they have a safety plan. And then they can also request additional services like I need to be able to get transportation to a hotel or a community service center, or I need help evacuating, or I would like a welfare check because I'm not leaving my house, but come make sure I'm okay or Uncle Bob's okay. We wouldn't do those kinds of services, but we partner with our interagency partners help us uh, make sure that folks are safe during a prolonged outage. And I'm going to wrap up. So, um, you know, the pace of change on the ground is really fast. Uh, we're seeing the impacts of climate change right on this. The technology advancements are changing, and we are positioning ourselves to advance our mitigation work and our response capabilities to effectively buy down the risk that our equipment's involved in a fire. How we're doing in that is we're monitoring best practices, we're bringing in outside expertise, we're working with skill staff to bubble up those projects and start building that pipeline of projects. And I'd expect to see our investments accelerating over time. That could even go faster if the couple of grant applications that we are part of a consortium are successful. We should know in August or September we have two federal grants. And then there's a couple of state grants that we're also looking at. So we can't do this alone. We're working with our customers to build that risk awareness and, and continue to move forward. We went to this season. So um, I'm going to stop there. Note that the draft is in your packet, had a couple of typos that some Eagle Eye staff figured out. Thank you very much. So with those are what we'll go to the PUC. We'll have those corrections plus the number two PUC today. Um, great. I like it. I think that we're moving in the right direction. Learning each step that we take is good. Um, on the sensitivity, when you moved it last year, when we moved it, bumped it up, we have a a ballpark of how many times it got tripped and how many times we had to go out and do it, and, and how much more that is going to be if we're running it from July to October. For the for the whole season, there was about six trips that that we would say was due to those settings, you know, or full feeder trips. Uh, I think there's two of them that, that we, we would call, uh, did we want those to happen? You know, you'll, you'll never know the right answer to that, but uh, so that, that's about the scale. It was, you know, it's field work, extra field work, but it was well worth it. And, you know, like I said, we kept the decision to do that. So, but, but that was six in. Uh, oh, for all of fire season. So from about June when we enabled it to the first couple oh, so of weeks last, of October. Last year, you read. Yeah, last year we went into protective settings in August okay. and through the end of October. Okay. So theoretically this year could be instead of three months, four months. Okay. But I think. But it wasn't a huge number. Okay. Yeah, the two on the end were, if you remember, it started raining very quickly. It felt like uh, it went from dry to dry to wet. And those those ones were right on the end when, when it was pouring outside and we had tripped. Right. And had to ask ourselves, should we keep this in? Um, and I, on your last slide, something that just kind of came up to me was, and this isn't immediate, but I think that if we're going to have red flags and, sh and total shutoffs, electrical vehicle charging is going to be something that we're going to need to to think about. Because if you're down for 36 hours and fire starts and you, you don't have your battery, 
just as we get more and more electrified. I think that that's another thing. Yeah, we're you know each year we're learning. I think yeah. that that's one other thing. Yeah, Brian? A question on your map that showed the area, of, especially of the river. Um, doesn't Lane Electric have a big part of that because of the key says electric service area and it surrounds the entire Mackenzie Valley? Doesn't that isn't all our, all our entire service area? Is that this map ends at Ida? Well, I probably can't tell right there, but that is the end of our service territory, and then oh, okay. electric all picks right. up. And so, if, if, if we um, Two other real quick questions. If we provide power and say to a substation that serves the other electric utility in the area, are we going to shut those substations off and quit providing power to other utilities? Holden Creek, for example, like you're talking about, that would, that would feed Blue River. Uh, so that's a partnership like the one last year, for example, that was a shared discussion with BPA, Lane Electric, and us. We wouldn't, unless there's an emergency situation, we wouldn't do that unilaterally. Okay. And then liability. I know that you look at our our claims or all our claims and stuff and every time we have a power outage somebody's ice cream melts and we get sued for it um if we do a voluntary shutoff because of a red flag warning do we still have liability for when we re-energize their you know all the tvs go out and their computers blow up and we get claims for those are we still liable for that if it's a voluntary? we'll get claims but the determination of them i'm trying to divert to our claims department answer the, the process to go through that but that's that's fine. I'm, I'm There's no guarantee of service, right? So um, yeah, I think they, that what makes a PSPS a little different is that we strive to give at least 24 hours notice, so oh, people okay. can make decisions about surge protectors or unplugging their equipment or plugging in their electric vehicle so it's fully charged or going to the gas station and getting gas because gas stations don't work when there's no power. Like you, these kinds of things, the purpose of um, trying to get as much advanced warning and predicting Mother Nature, which is really, really challenging, is to in, invite people to be ready for power interruptions because they're going to happen more frequently, whether it's because of summer or winter storms. We just are seeing more extreme weather. And this is, it's kind of runs, uh, you know, opposite of how we've acted as a utility for a hundred years. We've talked about reliability, reliability, reliability. Now we're saying, actually, you have to be prepared for outages. Thank you. I really like the plan. I'm going to move forward. I have questions based on this map. So the fire that sprung up is actually outside of our territory, right? So are we looking at, but I mean, obviously a fire can spread very easily. Do we, is there anything that we, do or think about on those edges where it's still high risk. I mean, it's surprising to me that that is the only area that is truly high risk where, you know, some of those other areas around there are still, again, I can't tell exactly what the area is, so but they're still fairly heavily forested in that whole southern section. Caution that these are the preliminary high fire risk zones that we had to pull together to get the plan in time, right? So. The analysis that we were talking about is to contract for a phase two risk analysis, and this will be way more in depth. Okay. And I think we're going to get better quality information. So these boundaries can change. Okay. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. By the same token, though, I'll say there might be some things in there that are not high risk fire zones. And so we don't have to shut off as many people or, or we have that consideration. So. So it should be a win-win to get the more detailed study. If there's another discussion, I think we need a motion. Very quickly, so it can be just um, say thank you for the presentation. Thank you for the work on this. Uh, it's super unsettling to me that we're in this position where three hundred are pushing us into this place. I'm super proud to be part of a utility that is taking it so seriously and being so adaptive and forward thinking. So thank you for the work. Really appreciate it. I appreciate the attention you're making to um, who are dealing with medical uh, equipment because it's essential. Um, so that's all. Thank you, and I'm super supportive of everything. Thank you. Uh, move to adopt. To approve. Second. Okay. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Right. Right. unanimously. Right. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, 
President Carlson, commissioners, uh, good evening. We have a team effort here to talk about uh, a number of different things relative to combination of the long term financial plan, uh, the capital improvement plans, uh, as well as um, kind of the impact and projected Im impact on the revenue requirement, which ultimately results uh, in, in rates. I'll kick things off and then I'll pass it to Rod. Uh, to go through some of the assumptions. Um, Karen will talk about the, the capital pieces of it, the capital priorities, and then uh, Deborah will bring it all together uh, with the, the outcome when it comes to, to the impact on our finances. Uh, just a little bit of a, this is really the, the bottom line up front. It's kind of a summary of, of everything. I'll just touch on a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, on the electric side, uh, we have included um, uh, in the plan to include the pre-funding for the Lieberg decommissioning uh, that uh, has resulted in uh, about an 8.2% uh, rough impact on the rates over the 10 year view. Uh, and water or the electric side has over the, the course of the, the plan, which is a 10 year long-term financial plan, uh, the average uh, annual yearly increase is a, a little over what we had originally targeted in that two to four percent range, it's, it's pushed that up to a little over four uh, percent. On the water side, um, we do have, um, we did move in about $15 million of spending into the, the near term years. The water side does include uh, the investment in a second source. Um, and over the 10 year view, the average is about six and a quarter percent. Uh, on the average uh, annual rate increases uh, over the life of, of the plan. Again, that's that's a little bit outside of what we wanted to do um, from our original benchmarking to inflation. Uh, some of that is because of the investments we're making. Some of it is also because, as, as you can imagine, and even commissioners have asked for us to make some slightly different assumptions around inflationary impacts. Uh, we are seeing some, some rate pressures uh, that are pretty specific to our industry, but not to eWeb, uh, including some of the labor market pressures that we're, we're feeling, supply chain uh, pressures and expenses. Uh, we're also on the water side seeing some declining in the consumption going forward. That's a pretty typical pattern. It's not just eWeb. I think that's we're seeing that across the, uh, really the United States, uh, the per capita water consumption and number that which is consumer behavior is is decreasing and that puts a little more pressure on the the fixed cost uh, and the to the remaining consumption that we're we're forecasting um, and and we're also in incorporating a little bit of the inflation that we're seeing this year into the long-term financial plan going forward so we've already experienced some of this inflation that we're now forecasting into the, the future but on the water side, we're still in good position um, relative to our comparators and the electric rates on the electric side will be mid tier uh, on the water side. We're the second lowest uh, in the region. We'll probably after even with a second source investment be in the in the lower third uh, would be would be my estimate after investing in a second source. So pretty quite a bit of headroom on the water side from a market perspective. Just a little bit of context as far as where we are. Uh, the board has the opportunity uh, through this process uh, on the left there to provide input and guidance relative to economic assumptions and also strategic assumptions. Uh, this is really an ongoing cycle where we look at our, our strategic plan, our priorities. We look at our economic assumptions. Assumptions Those feed into the, the green box there, which is when we're looking at our long term financial plan, capital plans. Uh, which are fed by a number of different master plans that ultimately results uh, that we come back to the board for our uh, annual budget uh, approvals at the end of the year, uh, as well as our specific uh, rate development uh, process. Um, so ultimately concludes in some public hearings uh, as well as final approval of, of the budgets and the rates. This is kind of where this is a reiteration of that we're in in June, July, and we'll have a number of different events between now and the end of the year, including and two public hearings on on the rates. So then I'm going to pass it to Rod, who's going to run through some of the, the priorities on the strategic and the economic side. 
Uh, thanks, Frank. Um, uh, I think you covered the, the I was kind of like even sort of listening to this conversation and thinking about the IRP. So the IRP is a model, so uh, yeah, don't, don't hurt me here, but I, I kind of see the, the financial system as a model. You know, I know there's dollars and cents and all that, but remember we've, we've talked about turning those dials and everything. And so um, Frank highlighted the, uh, the input that the board gets to have in this process, right? And so uh, what we did was, and of course this is all on your background or so I, I don't want to go through each piece specifically detail, but uh, these are, are the particular strategic and operational guidance points that, that um, the board gets to, to weigh in on. I think Commissioner Brosnan, you asked about the second source, for instance. So part of our strategic goals from our strategic plan is to become more resilient by adding a second source, for instance. So uh, this is a, uh, an input here where we say, hey, uh, this is very important due to our strategic plan. We have a, a second source in here to create some resiliency. So, much like last year, um, um, we were focusing on those same strategic areas, uh, reliability, compliance, and then investing in programs and, and projects that increase resiliency. Um, the one exception, the one difference from last year is, uh, and this will be covered in a couple of places, but the, the addition of the, the Leeberg refunding decommissioning to the electric plant. Um, Otherwise, pretty much everything else is the same. One uh, piece of feedback we did take is uh, around the customer care. Uh, we got some feedback from the board about how, how that is funded and how it's calculated and, and funding amounts that go into that. So we've taken a preliminary look at modeling uh, or creating a different model around how that's created. Or not as calculated. And it's tied more towards local economic indicators and inflation and some of those kind of things. In essence, it, the, the calculation ended up somewhat close to the same as if we had. But nonetheless, there's, uh, you'll get more detail, I'm sure, from the uh, on here tonight or next time around. Um, the other area uh, of interest is the um, cost escalation. So, so as you look at the, the, the economic forecast assumptions, um, Frank talked about this a little bit. Um, we did a feedback last year about uh, making sure we're accounting for the last year or two and even here in the economic impacts. Uh, we got the escalators uh, higher than the, than the forecasted uh, uh, federal uh, area and, and cost escalation amounts. Um, those in the long term financial plan return back to the quote unquote normal 3%, 3%. Um, and money's fascinating, I know, in inputs, but um, the, um, uh, again, the assumptions are pretty, pretty similar to what we had last year, including the model. And, and after it's all said and done, um, all our financial targets are being met. Support policies, debt coverage, and all that kind of stuff. And Alicia will go into that here. Um, we are, uh, again, uh, getting the scope, which Karen's going to talk about projects and that kind of thing. I wanted to pause right here before I turn it over uh, and see if there's any questions about those assumptions, you know, performance, any of that. Um, okay. we're, we're good to go. So, Karen. Okay. Karen Kelly, TV, Chief Operations Officer, and I get to talk about the investments that we'd like to make um, here. And the coming 10 years. So just a reminder that in order to continue to safely execute our strategic plan, we have to continue to invest in the systems through our capital improvement planning process. This year's 10 year plan continues that progress on projects that we put forth over the last couple of years. Um, and it meets our strategic plan goals of completing all compulsory work, maintaining reliability, including the delivery and, uh, and quality and safety of our products as well as increasing resiliency and really targeting projects that can do that for us to, to increase that. 
Um, and just want to remind folks too that that we're talking about these projects from source to tap and source to switch. So from every aspect of our systems. So starting out with the water utility, um, our plan components are essentially the same in this coming 10 year period as we provided to you in the last 10 year period. So we're continuing to invest in the systems and ramp up towards uh, second source construction, which is beginning in 2025. Our type one work includes compulsory service and pipeline work, emergent and planned minor facility work, as well as information systems and fleet equipment replacement. Our type two work continues base level reservoir replacements, transmission system upgrades, as well as shared service projects, including eWeb Enterprise Solutions and the Bertelsen property expansion. Type three is primarily the second water treatment plant on the Willamette River. And uh, you can find a really good summary of uh, kind of the board process in the backgrounder from October 2021. So um, that would be a good one to go back and, and take a look at if you you know need a refresher on where we were and, and where we've gone to. This slide, uh, just want to say up front, this is just highlights of the plan from 2023 to 2024. In other words, what has changed in that amount of time? These numbers aren't going to add up, so um, I, I'm looking at the finance people. Don't look at that. Just taking the, the big chunks out and, and highlighting some of those things. So um, the overall plan is $342 million, and it's down $3 million, or approximately 0.9% from last year's 10-year plan. As Frank and Rod mentioned earlier, the water utility is experiencing higher rate pressure due to cost escalation, including inflation, labor, ongoing supply chain disruptions, and movement of some of the shared service project costs to earlier in the 10-year plan, which can contribute to earlier compounding rate increases. Our base level work uh, for storage is going down because of a slow ramp up on College Hill, and we also have a planned gap year between College Hill and what will be the next base level reservoir project, which is either Hawkins or Santa Clara. Um, and we are continuing throughout this plan to work on our upper level reservoirs as well. I don't want them to get lost in the shuffle as we're talking about the, the, the main storage. Uh, as transmission projects have progressed in planning, costs have gone up and estimates have been revised. So you can see that on this chart. AMI costs are going down because we anticipate project completion in 2024. Um, and then the cost of our Willamette River water filtration plant has gone up as the project schedule has moved up by six months. And it's now, when you look at it this year, the, the entire project's in the next five years. So that, that five-year window also can affect that compounded cost of um, the increases. So those are the highlights. Again, there's a lot of detail on this in your backgrounder. Moving to the electric side of the house, um, the plan components again are the same uh, as we have shown in last year's 10-year plan to this year's 10-year plan. We continue to invest in the system and make progress on the Carmen Smith relicensing requirements. Our type one work focuses on ramping up asset replacement and moving from reactive to proactive replacement, along with stabilizing equipment and resources, and includes our communications equipment, fiber, downtown network, fleet, information services, and much more. Our type two focuses on enhancing resiliency of our highest impact loads, risk-based rebuilds and renewals, including the 10 substations in 10 years efforts that we have planned. Uh, it's managing emergency, emerging risks to the system, including dam safety, wildfire, load growth with electrification and other transmission and distribution needs, as well as earthquakes, and um, also uh, accounting for strategic initiatives such as the eWeb Enterprise Solutions and AMI. Uh, our type three work, again, is uh, focused on the relicensing requirements of Carmen Smith, both with the plant and with the risk mitigation projects, and, and you have seen quite a bit of that in our consent items as of late. So taking that same view, again, these numbers won't add up, um, but it gives you the highlights of what's changed in that 10-year plan from 2023 to 2024. So the overall 2024 10-year plan is $613 million. Uh, $24 million, or 4.2%, is higher than the 2023 plan. Um, as Rod discussed, the rate trajectory is not as impactful over the 10-year span as in water, but it's still affected by cost escalation, including inflation, labor, ongoing supply chain disruption, 
and the addition of some shared service projects. The electric infrastructure went down due to new and better estimates for projects, completion of work such as the current project, which is expected to end next year, and some of the transformer changeouts that are also ending earlier in the plan, and as well as um, affected by more stable supply cost projections. AMI is going down due to initial deployment completion again in 2024, we're hopeful. And the movement of that next round of deployment, you know, it's going to come back around again, but we've moved that out of the 10 year window. So that's another reason why you see that cost coming down. Like with water, the enterprise solution costs and capitalization of software and updated project estimates have resulted in an increase in this area for information services. And for generation, uh, more information on the Lieberg near-term risk reduction measure costs, plus estimates for real property acquisition is uh, uh, resulting in a significant increase in the costs for the 10-year plan in the generation side of things. Um, I wanted to mention that the real property estimates in the past have been assuming that we might be able to do partial acquisition or um, obtain easements. And uh, we've decided that we wanted to budget for full cost acquisition in case we can't negotiate some of those other options. So that's why that number looks higher. The risk reduction measures are going to help with eventual de decommissioning work that is coming. So I did want to mention that. Um, and then I think it's important to note because I got hung up on this earlier that most of the decommissioning work is going to be O&M. So you're not going to see it in the capital plan. Uh, it's really just some of this uh, real property work and the near term risk reduction measures and then some minor work that we'll have to do on water rights that will be capitalized. So with that, I'm going to have a slight pause again, remind you that there this was just a brief overview. There is a lot more information in your backgrounder, but I'll pause there and see if there's questions. Deborah has it. Thank you. Good evening, Deborah Hart, CFO. I feel like my colleagues have said most of what I have to say today, so thank you. Uh, uh, but here are the numbers, starting with the water utility. Uh, this plan as drafted does remain within board targeted metrics. Uh, the yellow that you see up there, though, is stress on debt service in the latter half of the plan, and that is um, a result of the utility taking on substantial debt uh, for the planned $340 million in investments. Um, the 10-year rate trajectory is at 83%, and approximately 25% of that is due to second source. This plan does assume conventional borrowing for um, the second source, however, we are actively pursuing uh, other opportunities, be it with you, certainly if uh, we'll pursue any potential grant funds. But for now, this is our conventional borrowing. And moving on to electric, again, it does remain within uh, board targeted metrics as drafted, albeit with stress in the years highlighted in yellow. So a uh, little stress on cash and reserves staying above target, however, and then debt service at the end of the plan. Uh, rate increases compounded are approaching 50%, but that is inclusive of the of decommissioning of the Lieberg project. Uh, the plan is supporting $615 million in investments in infrastructure and the rate increases dedicated to Lieberg are sufficient to fund the decommissioning uh, as projected. So what does that do to rates? Right now, as you can see, uh, as of June, these rates were pulled, and this is everybody's rates in June. So ours today and our comparators. Uh, EWEB is right there in the middle for electric. Uh, the rate projections that were included in this presentation would bump up the average single family all electric to $193 a month. And then on the water side, we're second from the bottom. And the plan is projected is about a three per uh, three dollar 
rate increase for the average single family home. Uh, we ran some numbers on general service. Their usage does vary a lot more, but the average small general service would see a $36 increase on the electric bill and uh, 14 on the water. And that opportunity for questions. Sorry to get into the minutia, but I'm not going to let this go. So we're, I, I looked at the second highest priority on water, on, on the watershed restoration on the Mackenzie, and we may manage and maintain all the spill response trailers. Why not, why have we not reached out to Springfield Utility Board saying, since they're going to be drawing water from the Mackenzie, why aren't they participating in these costs? I, I just say, I don't believe that we haven't. Our, te our teams talk regularly. Why we haven't, so so the source protection teams talk regularly. Why we haven't, I guess, as a board or as leadership gone to their leadership, I, I think possibility. Yeah. I mean, to me, it only seems fair. I mean, we're, we're footing the entire bill for the protection, the restoration of, you know, they're building an own independent plan right now to suck water out of the Mackenzie. And the same thing we're protecting. And uh, why are we footing the entire bill for it? We haven't even asked them. That's something that we could do. I'm sorry, it's a little off topic, but I'm certainly ask the commissioner. Um, I'll ask. Thank you. So on the on the water side, Frank alluded to it earlier on that. Water usage is down. It is at 95% is what we're targeting. Is that 95% over the 10 year or is that 95%? I mean, is it dropping 5% a year? Um, it, bring this. <laughs> you can answer it. Uh, so the 95% is a 95% of the five year average is what we use to budget to, as opposed to the 100%. And that gives us the contribution margin risk tolerance. Uh, what we did was go back over a seven year look back period to see what um, growth looks like on uh, those projections. So as we move beyond the budget year, uh, we're not had not been realized over the last seven years, so we really ratcheted that back. It's not actually a decline, but it's just a very subtle growth. Yes, and I guess that would be you mentioned that it was not just geographic Asian Y and usage is down. Does that mean that we need to? Scale back the the size of our second treatment plant and the capacity that we're doing on that. We projected it five years ago. Yeah, I don't believe we we should. I think when you look at what was driving the size of the second treatment plant, it was for our our base minimum winter load, um, where you're seeing a lot of sort of per capita reductions is coming with things like landscaping and things like that that are probably more summer oriented. But um, having the, the size that we would size the, the back up, I, I think it's a minimum size actually. Okay. Um, and then on the summaries of the long-term financial plan, you had, if you could back up just a couple slides, and it, it, you can go to either one, the, yeah, that, that's fine. You only have rate stabilization listed in 24 and 25. Is that, and it was the same on water, is that uh, something that is just? That's funding coming out of, out of the rate stabilization for those years. So, so that's taking money out of rate taking stabilization. Out of rate stabilization. Okay. Um, I guess. Just for me going forward, it would be interesting. You know, we, we have we have reserve policies on one night, and we have this on another night. Nowhere up here do I see reserves. So, so other than other than the targets, I guess total cash. Oh, never. Okay, there they are. Total cash reserves. 
So our rate stabilization fund is at five million. Is that what our target is for all electricity? And what is it on water? One. One. Okay. And so you're using that nine million and eight million because we were at about fifteen right now. We're over. We're over the target. And when the money went in there, the uh, idea was done. And so that's. That's bringing those two years to seven, seven, five, and seven, two, five. If, if we didn't use rate stabilization, those would be a, a point or so higher, maybe. The, the rate increases. Now you're asking me to do higher level math in my head, but yes, that is helping to mitigate the rate increases in those years. Okay. Um, yeah, it's about. But the, the, the long term effect of those rate increases, and that's a oh, one time yeah, impact okay. of drawing out the. Okay. And, and, and why is there just such the big drop off into 26 here? Going from 7.5 or 7.25% to 3.75. Probably helps if I would look at the same one as you were. So. Um, yeah, it's the pre-funding primarily. We have a very um, aggressive pre-funding. Pre the last question is on, on bonding. Um, you know, right now, if you have to go out for bonds, it's going to be high because interest rates are higher. Are, 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 we, are we thinking those are going to come down and we're going to pull the money as we need it late, later on in the forecast? So historically, bond rates, uh, we were maybe a little bit spoiled in 2020 when rates were amazingly low. Um, and we actually, in, in the history of the last 30 years or so, the rates were still fairly favorable. But that was a consideration and why we didn't think about borrowing more money for electric now, um, volatile markets, and not an immediate need. And if staying out of the market might a little bit lower rates. We're still forecasting um, rates that are a percentage point, a full percentage point higher than we paid, than we will pay on bonds that we just borrowed for. Thank you. Thank you. There, sorry. <laughs> uh, I guess just in summary, um, covering our assumptions and our making our metrics and any other to me. I guess the only well, in, in, in conclusion, I think the, the other thing that will be important is, is, a, is our messaging here because we've had low to no rate increases for quite some time. And now we're going to be looking at significant rate increases over a significant period of time and being able to tell the story directly. And, and yeah, this is something that I'm asking from you guys is Maybe even just a, a, an FAQ to give to us, so that when uh, so that when our constituents come to us and say, "What the hell's seven and a half percent?" that I can say, you know, "Hey, this is what we're doing and why we're doing it," more succinctly than be saying, "Well, there's Lieberg and there's second source and there's this and that." If there if there's a good communication plan, that would help me when I'm talking to constituents uh, on this type of. Uh, Significant rate increase. Matt? I just say thanks for the packet. You continue to provide financial information in ways that are simple enough that I understand them. At least I think I understand them. Um, and and with that, I appreciate the highlighting of you know where the board policies are set and when we're approaching those, just tagging those kind of bounds. Um, highlighted is super helpful and.
I, I, I suspect we all feel a little uncomfortable by where this is going, but I also don't. I don't see that there's a lot of options for us to change course on any of these, like all these projects that we have in the pipeline are long term expensive and inflation's biting us and but, but staying the course seems like the right thing to do from everything that I'm seeing. I would appreciate the compre comprehensive information. Um, I guess that, that would be an invitation. If there's an out here that we don't know about, please speak now. Oh, I, I was going to I was going to say that I think that. When you look at the assumptions, you look at the investments, you get a certain outcome and what Deborah has to do is then balance that with the policies that we have in place to keep us financially sound. And when we do that, it drives rates a certain direction and trajectory, and we we don't like that any more than, than anybody else does. Uh, but it's driven by our strategic investments. We have a very capital intensive uh, type of, of organization and we're operating in an environment that is not very conducive to to investments uh, because of uh, some of the, the items that you listed. All that said, we're going to continue to look for opportunities to uh, mitigate the financial impacts on our customers. And I, and I think that's that work is never done. And I know that this team and and the rest of the organization is viewing it like this is our customers money it affects them and we're going to continue to look for opportunities to improve that so you know this is where we are but it's 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 something that we're going to continue to pursue yeah and, and i see that i see the organizational dedication to trying to control our costs to the extent possible um, so the only one other question I have is, have we budgeted for the party that we're going to have when AMI is done? <laughs> That's my question, because it's going to be big. Yeah. Bring your own. <laughs> it should be. <laughs> Thanks. Quick question. Um, the sale proceeds from headquarters, it, that going to go in to offset any of these costs because I know we had discussions of how much of that money goes to water and how much it goes to electricity. Where does that come in, or does that even come into this conversation so we could soften it? I mean, 12 million bucks is a lot of money. And the sale proceeds are in those cash balances. As so it's already factored in. There. Already factored in. I know. Thank you. I had the same question the first time I saw them. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Is it back to me? It is. Uh, commissioners, uh, uh, just a few new items to point out on the board agenda report. Um, one thing that's, that I think is important um, is that uh, next month you'll get a correspondence item describing the uh, communications plan and outreach plan for um, the College Hill project. And then we're, we have some agenda time, the meeting after that, to actually walk through and understand if there's any questions or comments or guidance that you'd like to, to provide it. Um, the next few months have uh, a number of items that, you know, we have several guest speakers um, coming um, on different subjects uh, from um, uh, energy efficiency and conservation, to forecasts for the for the region and also an update on some of the, the hydro um, challenges and that we have um, from Northwest River partners on the, on the Columbia. And so just those are just a few things to point out. Um, we also have a work session coming up uh, in August as well on, on the to discuss the DEI proposed DEI policy. So um, I'll just 
open it up if there's any questions or suggestions, but uh, those are just some of the new highlights. One thing that I noted, it said on here that our next quarterly occurrence is supposed to be in July for the city of Eugene liaison update. I don't think that's scheduled, correct? Uh, I don't I don't believe that is scheduled at this point. Um, and that needs to be updated just as our next is in July, and I don't think we've had any conversation at all about it. When we're setting that next meeting up. Pardon me, I didn't hear you. That, that, that was it. I mean, okay. Just probably get going on that because it took, I don't know, two months to find the dates it's, for the last one. It's around. Okay. And they're on their break here pretty soon. I think. Yeah. August, yeah. Did you get a break? Can you take a break? What's, you, break? <laughs> what is the date of the uh, the DEI meeting in August? It's August sixteenth. It's almost like four. August fourteenth. August fifteenth. Fifteenth. Fourteenth. Well, we're we surrounded. It. I see it on the fifteenth. Who's it? Okay, great. Uh, just a heads up on agendas. The next two meetings, the next one I will probably be doing virtually. And then the following one after that, I don't know if I'm going to do virtually or not, because I'll be in Europe and it'll be 2 30 in the morning. And so I don't know if I'm going to do it at 2 30. So the September 1st one. I'm starting to slip. Give me an excuse to absence. I've got great excuses. All right. Just, just giving you guys heads up. I saw it. Um, first of all, I apologize for in this meeting. I'm just jet lagged, but um, uh, but tonight was a super long meeting, and what we had at the end was really important. And so I just wonder, if we've done this before, but in future meetings, like even if we had just had this portion as like a virtual meeting, like a second, anyway, it just like it'll end up being close. Well, if I don't advertise nuclear energy <laughs> next time, then we'll just be, yeah. the natural gas, gas ban would do it. Too. The coal out too. <laughs> I wonder if you're going September 5th, is there an opportunity for us to bump that meeting to something where you're available? I don't want to turn everything upside down, but yeah, I, I'm going to be gone the first. I don't think I get back to like the 12th of September, so. Uh, yeah, I guess September. I think I leave the 12th. I guess we could have us on the weekend. I, I, I think you guys got four strong voices here. I, I mean, I'll read the packet and I can send in questions and that type of stuff. And I may attempt it. Right? Drink enough we espresso. Wait, what day we talk about? September 5th. Looks like most of it's updates and informational too, but it's not. I mean, right now it doesn't. I'll say there's nothing controversial, but I, I, that may change. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, do something really controversial. I mean, uh, <laughs> you announce a rate change before that meeting. Okay. Anything else? All right, board wrap up. Is there any steam left? In? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Being adjourned. <laughs> I think that's not even bad.